committee meeting. Um, and, and I'll just remind you, and the clerk's going to give you more of a background, and so will Sean Baird, but I understand that the technology allows you folks, uh, the, my, my diligent counselors and mayors, to see much of what's going on. Our screens are blind here, so I trust you're all out there. We'll go through roll call, and we're going to make this work, and uh, especially my appreciation to the technology staff that have done so much work this week uh, to make sure that this thing runs as seamlessly as possible, and you're going to hear more about that. So I'm going to start with the call to order, and Madam Clerk, can I suggest that I take that, turn that over to you? Um, as is the last uh, case, uh, just so we don't end up playing broken telephone, I think it serves us so well that instead of me being an intermediary and calling votes when uh, the clerk then has to substantiate them, I'll let her do that, and it just seems to make things run more smoothly. So with that, Madam Clerk, first item on our agenda is the call to order. If you would proceed, please. And, and there we are. So what I had Sean Baird up next right after the call to order um, to give us details, but perhaps I'm being told it might work more smoothly if I call on Sean Baird, uh, Head of Digital and Information Services, to give an update on the council technology. So Sean, you are up. Thank you very much, uh, Regional Chair, and good morning, councillors. Um, as you can see, we are using new technology today to facilitate our regional council meeting. Uh, I want to just start by acknowledging the concerns we heard from each of you following our first two council meetings. And I want to let you know what we've been doing to address some of these issues. I also want to thank the IT support teams at each of the local municipalities for working closely with us to troubleshoot, configure, and support each of you. Following our first two meetings, we experienced two issues. Uh, first, that the format of the software did not allow us to see everyone, and presentations appeared very small on the screen. Second, some councillors experienced disconnections from the meeting. And these two issues together led to a poor experience for you. And I want you to know that we've been working hard to address both issues. On the first issue of the format, we have considered a set of alternative solutions. While Skype is a leading platform and capable of hosting these meetings, each platform offers different functionality. And we have carefully reviewed Zoom, Microsoft Teams, and Cisco WebEx. Zoom is a very user-friendly and familiar product to many of you. However, there are currently multiple warnings issued by governments and IT advisory groups against its use due to security concerns, allowing malicious actors to gain control of these meetings. Microsoft Teams is a great product, which we at the region and many of your own local IT teams are in the process of rolling out internally. However, it is somewhat untested in this sort of environment. <clears throat> and finally, Cisco WebEx is a well-established product capable of improving the experience and already in use by two of the local municipalities. Following our evaluation, we've decided to proceed with Cisco WebEx, as you can see. We've been working very closely with those municipalities already using it to mimic the configuration you are already familiar with, and with those municipalities not already using it to ensure proper rollout of devices and client software to each of you. I recognize that this is a bigger shift for some of you who are not familiar with this software, and I appreciate your patience as we roll out this new platform. Now, the second issue is disconnections, and this is more difficult. There are two primary reasons why you're seeing more disconnections at this meeting than you are at the local council meetings. First, there are more participants. And second, there is naturally more diversity of connections. For example, today we have councillors connecting via four different types of laptops, as well as some on iPads, other tablets, and mobile phones. We have worked closely with each of your local IT support teams to ensure these various devices are properly configured and that each of you are supported. We've also reviewed the technical logs from our first two meetings and worked directly with Microsoft. And we've confirmed that the regional network and Skype performed properly throughout the first two meetings. That said, there will always be some risk of disconnections occurring. The internet service providers that we all rely on are experiencing a wide variety of network issues every day, and everyone's home networks function differently, often needing some unique level of troubleshooting when something goes wrong. We have upgraded our ability to monitor the technical side of this meeting including the quality of each participant's connection and the various devices you are all using. With this information, we will be better able to troubleshoot those disconnections, which will inevitably occur. If we continue to experience an unacceptable number of disconnections, we could take a further step of limiting the types of devices and software which connect into the meeting. This is effectively how each of your local council meetings are working today, as your local IT support teams manage and configure a smaller group of devices for each of you. We would prefer not to do this as it creates a whole other set of issues to manage, but it remains an option for the future. I wanna thank you for your patience as we get this sorted out. 
I also want to invite your feedback on today's and future meetings as we move forward. Thank you. Sean, thank you very much. And I mean, carrying on on that theme, and by the way, I was remiss in certainly thanking my folks up here and all the work that they've done. Shout out to the local IT groups, and I was told we got a great deal of support from our friends in Mississauga, Brampton, and Caledon as well. So I want to acknowledge that as well. Madam Clerk, why don't you please carry on with the process and procedures regarding today's meeting? Thank you, and good morning. I'm going to briefly review the rules and protocols for electronic participation in this regular council meeting. During these meetings, we continue to comply with provincial orders and public health orders and recommendations to support social distancing, as well as prohibiting public gatherings of more than five people. To that end, this meeting is being streamed live from the Region of Peel website, and we encourage the public to stay home in accordance with provincial and public health recommendations and listen to the proceedings from there. We are actively screening all those that are here in person. Further, we have purposely spaced people in the chambers more than two meters from each other to maintain a physical distance. The people present in the council chambers are Chair Unica, myself and clerks and IT staff sufficient to facilitate the technology and procedures of this meeting. There will be no more than five persons in the chambers throughout this meeting. We are conducting this meeting using WebEx. If you are dialing in, please note that you will be required to identify yourself so that we can update the system with your name. Connecting to the, media, to the meeting via dial-in is not a preferred method because connectivity is limited. For an optimum WebEx experience, we ask you to please take the following measures to avoid feedback and confusion with members speaking over one another. Please keep your microphones muted unless you have the floor to speak. Please use a headset and avoid using hands-free devices or speakers. Please speak loudly and clearly when you have the floor. Please ensure that any surrounding environmental noise, such as televisions, radios, and pets, are eliminated. The recommended WebEx meeting display view is active speaker view video view, or active speaker and thumbnail video view, so that you will have a full view of the presentation slides and other meeting materials. During a presentation, we recommend that you close your participation list so you have a full view of the presentation slides. If you are experiencing a poor Wi-Fi connection, please disable your video. If you drop off the meeting, please rejoin. And if you have difficulties, please contact your local IT department first for assistance, following the same process you do for your local council meetings. As required, your local IT department will reach out to regional IT staff for further assistance. Thanks for the technical staff at the cities of Brampton and Mississauga and the town of Caledon who are standing by to provide assistance to their respective councillors. The collective technical staff have done an excellent job pulling it all together. The video function for WebEx has been activated, so you may choose to turn on your video. You can choose to leave it on throughout the meeting, or you can turn on your video only when you are speaking. If you don't want to activate the video feed, you are not required to do so. We will still hear you, just to not see you. We have also activated the chamber cameras for this meeting. During staff presentations, the slides will be visible on your screens. If you have difficulty viewing the slides, they were all provided to you in the revised agenda that was distributed on Tuesday. Those participating electronically will not have access to the usual request to speak button. If you wish to speak, please click on the round participant icon at the bottom of your screen to enable your participant list. To indicate your request to speak, please raise your hand by clicking on the hand icon located to the right of your name in the participation list. Your hand icon will turn blue when engaged. Members who connect to the meeting via the dial-in option can send an email to council at peelregion.ca and you will be added to the speaker list. When called upon, please unmute your microphone and proceed. When you have concluded your comment or question, please mute your microphone and lower your hand by pressing the then blue hand to the right of your name in the participant list. After the response, the chair will circle back to you for any follow-up and confirm that you have yielded the floor. If you have any motions or amendments to introduce regarding today's business on the agenda, please email your motion to council at peelregion.ca, identifying yourself as the mover and also identifying the seconder for your motion. If you do not have a seconder, the chair will call for a seconder. If you wish to second the motion, please send an email to council at peelregion.ca and the first email received will be deemed to be the seconder. 
Each motion will be read in its entirety prior to calling a vote. Voting will be conducted verbally. For procedural votes that do not require a recorded vote, I will call for any objections. If you have an objection, please unmute your microphone and indicate your name and objection. If no objections are stated, the motion will be deemed to be adopted. For recorded votes, I will call upon each member in alphabetical order based on last name. Once called upon, please unmute your microphone and indicate your yes or no vote. I will, will confirm the vote for each member. This process will take some time, so please have patience. If you do not respond when called upon to vote, I will call your name a second time. If you do not respond to the second call, you will be recorded as, a, as abstaining from the vote and your vote will count in the negative as a nay vote. I will be calling roll call. Please indicate your presence by responding here when called upon. If you are leaving the meeting, please send an email to council at peelregion.ca to indicate that you are leaving the meeting. If you have left the meeting for any votes thereafter, you will be marked absent. If you don't advise that you are leaving the meeting and you don't respond when called upon to vote, you will be considered to be abstaining and a vote will be recorded in the negative as a nay vote. It is very important that you advise if you are leaving the meeting. If the meeting should move into closed session, those members who are participating remotely must ensure that no other person is in the location from which you are taking part in the meeting or make appropriate arrangements so that any other persons cannot see or hear any of the confidential deliberations taking place. If this is not possible, the member must withdraw from the meeting until it has moved back into public session. Prior to moving into a closed session, members shall declare that they adhere to the confidentiality standards as outlined in the Regional Council Code of Conduct. Members who leave the meeting during the in-camera session and attempt to connect back via the dial-in option will be required to send an email to council at peelregion.ca indicating their request to rejoin the meeting. We will temporarily pause the in-camera session and unlock the room to allow you to rejoin. You will be required to identify yourself upon joining the meeting. Those are a lot of instructions. If you have any questions as we proceed through the meeting, please send them to council at peelregion.ca together with a request to speak. We shall now commence the meeting with roll call. Mayor Brown. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Carl Carlson. Here. Thank you. Mayor Crombie. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Demurla has indicated she will be late this morning. Councillor Dasko. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Dillon. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Downey. Present. Thank you. Councillor Fonseca. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fortini. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Groves. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Innes. Here. Thank you. Councillor Kovac. Thank you. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Mahoney. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McFadden. Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Councillor Medeiros. Here. Thank you. Councillor Pileschi. Here. Thank you. Councillor Parrish. Here. Thank you. Councillor Raz. Present. Thank you. Councillor Sato. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Santos. Here. Thank you. Councillor Sinclair. Present. Thank you. Councillor Starr. Present. Thank you. Mayor Thompson. Present. Thank you. Councillor Vicente. Present. Thank you, and Chair Unica is present. Thank you. Thank you, and Madam Clerk, I already have a list of speakers. I don't know if they wish to ask questions. I'll take them at this time. Councillor Parrish? Um, I can't, I'm, I'm muting and unmuting. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions on your letter that you're going in with oh, oh. regard to Option six lands. So oh, Councillor Parrish, what I'll do, I'll deal with that when I get to that point then. I didn't know if you had a technical question about uh, oh. what we've heard so far. So I will, I will deal with that at that time and acknowledge you then. Uh, Councillor Fort, Councillor Fortini. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And good morning, everyone. Just wanted to add something about the garbage. Oh, okay. Awesome. And I will deal with that later in the agenda as well at the appropriate time. Thank you. With that, I'm on to 
the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. We would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather and which the region of Peel operates is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. For thousands of years, Indigenous peoples inhabited and cared for this land. In particular, we wish to acknowledge the territory of the Anishinaabek, Huron, Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Ojibwe Chippewa peoples. The land that is also home to the Metis and most recently, the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, who are direct descendants of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We are grateful to have this opportunity to work on this land and by so doing, give our respect to its first inhabitants. With that, I go on to declarations of conflict of interest. Hearing none, that brings me to the approval of the minutes. The first item that I have is item 4-1, the April 9, 2020 Regional Council meeting. I need a mover and a seconder. Councillor Parrish, I see you on the list. Can't see. Uh, on, on the list for what? Questions? Uh, 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 approval of the minutes, and I think yours may relate to that. I'm on to item 4.1 first, April tw uh, 9th, 2020, Regional Council, the approval of the minutes. And I'm just looking for a mover and a seconder. Ron Starr, a second. Thank you, Ron. And, and was that moved by Carolyn? Do I have a mover? It's been moved. Move. Oh, very good, thank you. All those in favor, hearing, and I'm only asking for those opposed, so are there any opposed? Hearing none, I consider that carried. Next item I have is item 4.2, um, the letter drafted by staff here before the uh, council. Councillor Parrish, did you have a question on that? Councillor Parrish, I see you on my list, and I thought you had questions regarding the letters, be they 4, 2, and 3. Do you have a question at this time? I do. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I was reading the uh, regulations on how to apply for uh, a change in one of these uh, in provincially uh, declared employment lands. One of the reasons uh, they ask is that you, have, you give a reason for the change, but you also give the level of support. And we did have a 17 to 7 vote. It's not included in your letter. I think it's important to add that. My second concern is um, the last line. Uh, I would be pleased to make myself and relevant Peel representatives available. Who are those relevant representatives that you suggest? Very good, Carolyn. And my answer to that would be whomever the council deems it should be. So just as I would want them to approve the correspondence, I would want council to direct me accordingly. So that would come back to us? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and would you consider adding the 17 to 7 vote? I have absolutely no problem if, if it can be taken as a, remembering again, it's staff that wrote it. Uh, I think your point is well made and that's the actual fact. I would be happy it's the decision of, of council because it's your letter is drafted by staff, but I think it's totally appropriate. I certainly would have no problem. I also had one more question, uh, probably to Patrick. Um, O'Connor, through you, Mr. Chair, um, when I look at that legislation or those regulations, it also says um, there may not be a change while property under consideration is at LPAT. Does that apply to them changing it as well? Through to Patrick? Um, I would read that as a uh, an option for them to decline a change based on the status of the lands being before the tribunal. Uh, I don't think it would prevent them from making a change because they have full authority to make a change or decline to make a change. But they might use that factor to decline to make the change. That we're asking for. Correct. Charming. Okay, thank you very much. My questions are answered. Thank you. Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, Council Parrish asked the question that I was going to ask with regards to the regulations. Um, happy to move your uh, letter, Mr. Chair, with the, um, with the changes. So I'm not sure at what point we want to do that. I I'd will be happy. I will take that right now. And Councillor Parrish, as the original movers and seconders, would you be happy to second that? 
Yes, I would. Very good. Um, so, Madam Clerk, what do you require beyond that? We'll call a vote to uh, ensure that that's the letter with the amendment that is uh, sent out. We'll, we'll call the vote for that. And just to uh, clarify, this is the letter from last week. That's correct, a draft of which is uh, included at item 4.2 with the one amendment uh, as suggested by Councillor Parrish and approved by Councillor Groves that it include the actual vote 17 to seven. Madam Clerk, can you proceed with calling the vote? Thank you. Mayor Brown? Uh, no. No? Mayor Brown, no. Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson, yes. Mayor Crombie? Yes. Mayor Crombie, yes. Councillor Demurla, have you joined? I, I don't believe Councillor Demurla has joined yet. We'll show her vote is absent. Councillor Dasko? Yes. Councillor Dasko, yes. Councillor Dillon? No. Councillor Dillon, no. Councillor Downey? No. Councillor Downey, no. Councillor Fonseca? Yes. Councillor Fonseca, yes. Councillor Fortini? Yes. Councillor Fortini, yes. Councillor Groves? Yes. Councillor Groves, yes. Councillor Innes? No. Councillor Innes, no. Councillor Kovac? Yes. Councillor Kovac, yes. Councillor Mahoney? Yes. Councillor Mahoney, yes. Councillor McFadden? Yes. Councillor McFadden, yes. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Medeiros, yes. Councillor Pileshi? No. Councillor Pileshi, no. Councillor Parrish? Yes. Councillor Parrish, yes. Councillor Raz? Yes. Councillor Raz, yes. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Sato, yes. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos, yes. Councillor Sinclair? No. Councillor Sinclair, no. Councillor Starr? Yes. Councillor Starr, yes. Mayor Thompson? No. Mayor Thompson, no. Councillor Vicente? Yes. Councillor Vicente, yes. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to other items under approval of the minutes. Item 4.3, Councillors Groves, email dated April 16, 2020, to the Regional Clerk providing a draft letter to the Minister of Municipal Affairs. Madam Clerk. It's there for receipt. Um, I see uh, direction required in my agenda. How exactly should we be proceeding with it? Because the motion uh, in 4.1 carried, that, or sorry, 4.2 carried, that uh, 4.3 would be for receipt. Very good. Uh, Councillor Groves. I'm moving receipt, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Second. Second. Uh, perhaps what I will do is it's been moved and seconded for receipt. Perhaps I'll call the vote. Does anybody object? And I don't even want to hear from anybody objecting to the receipt. Hearing none, Madam Clerk, does that satisfy you? Very good, that has been carried for receipt. Okay, moving on to the approval of the agenda. Do I have a mover and a seconder for approval of the agenda? I'll move it, Mr. Chair. Councillor McFadden. Councillor McFadden, seconded by? I'll second, Mr. Chair, Councillor Fonseca. Thank you very much. That the agenda for the April 23, 2020 Regional Council meeting include a copy of a resolution from the City of Mississauga regarding, oh, sorry, I think I've got the different one. This was just for approval of the agenda. That's right. Oh, sorry, and that was an additional. I forgot to acknowledge that. Absolutely correct. So there was one additional item here for approval as well. That the agenda of April 23, 2020 Regional Council meeting include a copy of a resolution from the City of Mississauga regarding long-term care facilities and senior home employees to be dealt with under communications, item 9.4, and further, that the agenda of the April 23, 2020 Regional Council meeting be approved with that amendment. I have a mover and a seconder. Again, I will only call for anyone objecting. Are there any objectors to our approved amended agenda? Councillor Fortini, are you on my list to speak? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to add a little bit of discussion on the garbage uh, that was picked up in my area. Very good. Madam Clerk, can I treat that as an inquiry at the appropriate time? Yes. 
Okay, yes, and we will deal with that at the appropriate time under inquiries from councillors. Thank you. With that, thank you. thank you. Does anybody object to the motion of approval of the agenda as amended? Hearing no one, I will take that as unanimously approved. Okay, that moves us on to item six, the consent agenda. Madam Clerk, I'm going to turn that over to you. Thank you. To facilitate the consent agenda item, Councillor Unica will, or sorry, Chair Unica will state each item number and title in the order it appears on the Regional Council agenda. Should you wish to hold the item, please unmute your microphone, identify yourself, and state hold. After the Chair has gone through the entire agenda, he will circle back and read all of the held item numbers. If we have missed any item that you want held, please unmute your microphone, identify yourself, and state the item number you would like to be held. The chair will then proceed to call the vote for the, council, or for the consent agenda. It is a recorded vote, so I will be calling out the names of each of you and confirming your vote. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, I will call them out. Uh, a lengthy list under delegations, communications, presentations regarding COVID-19, 81 to 88, that we will all be hearing. So that brings me to item nine, communications. Item 9.1, uh, letter from Minister Steve Clark. Again, uh, if I hear nothing, I'm assuming I have consent that it does not have to be held. Otherwise, if you could call out hold at the appropriate time, and that would be this time. So on item 9.1, is anybody asking for a hold? None. 9.2, another letter from the minister on consent. 9.3, a letter from Minister Caroline Mulroney, Minister of Transportation. Again on consent. The additional item 9.4, a resolution from Mississauga regarding long-term care employees. That too is on consent. I go to items under 11 related to planning. Item 11.1, Peel's Growth Management Program and Development Charges Performance 2019, an overview and figures here for information. Do I have consent on 11.1? Does anyone wish it held? On consent, 11.2, Region of Peel's comments on the second round of proposed regulations to the new community benefits charge. Does anyone wish it held? On consent. 13. Sorry, oh, Mr. Sorry. Chair, it's Councillor Sato. Hold, yeah. please. So we are holding item 11.2 at Councillor Sato's request. Thank you. On to 13. Items related to enterprise programs and services. 13.1, 2019 Operating Financial Triannual Performance Report, year end related to 13.2. Does anyone wish it held? On consent then, 13-2, 2019 Capital Performance and Impact on Capital Reserves. Here for information. On consent, 13-3, 2020 update of the Region of Peel's financial condition. Here for information. Again, consent. 13.4, Budget Policy and Reserve Management Policy Compliance Update. Consent. 13.5, 2019 2020, dedicated provincial gas tax funds. On consent. Thir uh, no, sorry, so Mr. Chair. Sorry. Karen Raz, can, can we please hold that one? By all means, 13.5 to be held at the request of Councillor Raz. Thank you. 13.6, annual accessibility status report for 2019. On consent, 13.7, Region of Peel Archives in the Peel Art Gallery Museums and Archives, PAMA. Here for information. Consent, item 15, related to public works, 15.1, amendment to the Region of Peel Traffic Bylaw 15 2013 to implement all way stop control at the intersection of Regional Road 1 and Regional Road 12 and at Regional Road 1 and Boston Mills Road in the town of Caledon Wards 1 and 2. Does anyone wish it held? On consent, item 15.2 has been withdrawn. 
Item 15.3, Lakeview Village Community Update on Interim Odor Control Improvements at the GE Booth Wastewater Treatment Plant in the City of Mississauga, Ward 1. Does anyone wish it held? If not, that is on consent. Then we have the regular agenda items and the bylaws. Madam Clerk. Number 19, my apologies, there was one other. Items related to human services. Under 19, this would be 19.1, service level housing subsidy agreement, federal housing providers in Peel. With regards to 19.1, does anyone wish it held? That is on consent. That brings me to the in-camera items, items under 24. Does anyone wish any of the following held? Item 24-1, April 9, 2020, Regional Council Closed Session Report. That is on consent. 24-2, Payment of Compensation Pursuant to the Expropriation Act, RSO 1990, CE26, the Gore Road Widening, Expropriation 09013-13, from Queen Street East to Castlemore Road, City of Brampton in Ward 10. Does anyone wish 24.2 held? On consent then, 24.3, appointment of Associate Medical Officer of Health. Does anyone wish it held? On consent. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Th and that is? Uh, so Councilor the, Raz, the associate medical officer and that's Councilor Raz. Very good to be yes. held. Twenty-three four at the request of Councilor Raz. Twenty-four four York Water Agreement Hanlon Feeder Main Project Credit. Does anyone wish twenty-four point four held? Then it is on consent. Very good, Madam Clerk. I need a resolution to deal with the consent agenda. And I need a vote, Madam Clerk, that vote is through you, so I turn it over to you for the consent agenda. Thank you. Mayor Brown? Yes. Mayor Brown in favor. Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie? I support. Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor DeMerla, I don't believe, has joined the meeting yet. Councillor Dasko? Yes. Councillor Dasko in favor. Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey? In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca? Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini? Yes, please. Councillor Fortini in favor. Councillor Groves? Yes. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes? Yes. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac? Councillor Kovac? Councillor Mahoney? Yes. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden? Yes. Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi? Yes. Councillor Pileshi in favor. Councillor Parrish? Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz? Uh, yes, and for those of you who may not have seen uh, Councillor Kovacs, uh, he was on, uh, Councillor Kovacs' microphone was on mute, but he gave the thumbs up, which means he voted the affirmative. Thank you. Oh, he does need to indicate, actually, so I'll, I'll circle back to Councillor Kovac. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Sato in favour. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favour. Councillor Sinclair? Yes. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr? Yes. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson? Yes, in favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente? Yes. Councillor Vicente in favor. Councillor Kovac? Yes. Councillor Kovac in favor. Thank you. There we go. Thank you. The motion carries. Very good. Well done, all. That moves us right along to presentations. A long list regarding the COVID-19 and related matters. Our first presentation, item 8.1, COVID-19 pandemic impacts, an oral update from Nancy Polzinelli, Interim Chief Administrative Officer. Nancy. Thank you, and through the chair. 
slide. Good morning, members of council. As today you will hear from some of our commissioners about key work during this COVID pandemic that demonstrates the strong sense of shared purpose and commitment to delivering on the needs of our community with your direction and support. First, I'd like to provide an overview of the region's efforts at the enterprise level and update council on how the region is preparing for the eventual but gradual recovery. Next slide. On March 12th, the Regional Emergency Operations Center, or REOP, was activated for the purpose of ensuring a coordinated and focused response to the escalating COVID-19 emergency. The REOP is guided by four clear objectives, protecting and promoting the health and well-being of residents of Peel and of staff, supporting public health and the broader health system response to the COVID-19 pandemic, coordinating efforts with our local municipal and community partners and providing trusted and timely information to the community, to council and regional staff. And most importantly, enabling critical work across regional programs to ensure the consistent delivery of essential services to our community in a rapidly changing environment. There have been many accomplishments since REOC was activated six weeks ago. Emergency operations centers have been established in all departments to help coordinate internal operational response based on scientifically established public health direction. Business and operational planning has identified work streams that could be paused, services that are essential, and areas of work that remain a priority. A comprehensive communication strategy has supported residents and the business community with just-in-time information in a variety of forms and languages, and ensured strong and supportive collaboration with our local municipal partners and other stakeholders. Dashboards have been created to monitor critical business intelligence to help guide decision-making at a time when information is changing constantly. Task force have been struck to address specific areas, including finance, capital and construction recovery planning, and surge and isolation housing, which I will speak to shortly, just to name a few. Finally, I want to highlight the successes we have had in establishing a coordinated and evidence-informed approach to the procurement of personal protective equipment and other critical supplies. This has been a challenge around the globe, but an essential component for effective response. We now have a system in place that centrally manages procurement and inventory for regional programs, facilitates connections with regional stakeholders, manages and integrates generous financial and supply donations from our community, and distributes supplies with ethical guidelines. Driven by the relentless pressure on our care providers and guided by the newly established Surge and Isolation Housing Task Force, we have launched a temporary housing program to support the region's frontline staff. Now the region's long-term care staff who are caring for COVID positive residents or are required to self-isolate or work self-isolate and feel they are unable to do so safely at home have a safe housing alternative. Plans are in place to expand this program to other frontline staff in the coming days. Next slide. We all recognize the great sacrifice that many are making during this crisis and every effort must be made to support them. And this includes many of us taking on responsibilities outside of normal roles. While over 70% of our current workforce is critical to the delivery of essential services, others have been redeployed to support those essential services in long-term care, public health, and in our housing and homelessness programs. Our redeployment strategy is ongoing and adapts to meet emerging staffing needs. And where there is not a match for redeployment, employees are provided with options that offer job security and support wherever possible. Screening has been a key need in our long-term care homes to support the risk of transmission to our long-term care residents and staff. And we have supported this through redeployment. Recognizing the large footprint of our regional buildings and our large staff pool, we have also proceeded with active screening for symptoms of COVID upon entry to all regional buildings and excuse me, work sites. 
now going beyond the four walls of the region and to support needs of the broader healthcare and frontline workers in Peel, we have partnered with licensed childcare centers to open nine locations across Peel, providing 190 emergency childcare spaces for children up to the age of 12. We are monitoring the demand of this service and will expand the number of spaces as needed. In addition to ongoing and multiple modes of communication and specific programs such as the isolation housing, through our human resource team, we continue to provide staff with general wellness and self-care support, including a human resources hotline for questions and comments that are responded to on a daily basis. As always, the region's employee and family assistance provider Homewood is available for expert information and support if required. As you know, supporting staff is so important. Not only does it help drive positive outcomes for our communities, it is an essential component of the region's approach to building a community life. Next slide. Although COVID-19 affects people from across all dimensions of diversity, and from every corner of the globe, the impact of this pandemic is not felt evenly. The disparities and challenges that face the most vulnerable members of our community are heightened today. And the Regional Community Response Table was formed to in part address that inequity. The Community Response Table brings together virtually over 90 agencies from across the so social services and health sectors and representatives from our three local municipalities three times a week. Together with the region and municipalities, the non-for-profit and community sector agencies share information, coordinate responses to emerging needs, they problem solve, and they collaborate to provide solutions. This is an excellent example of innovation and partnership. Since its inception five weeks ago, the group has further self-organized into five subtables: family violence, seniors, volunteers, systemic discrimination, and municipal partners. They have done this to enable action and co-develop solutions for our community. This week alone, they have responded to over 135 inquiries and requests for support. In addition, through this table, community agencies have received over a million dollars in funding to date. As you know, in our community, COVID-19 is disproportionately impacting our long-term care homes and other congregate living settings. Today, Kathy Granger, Commissioner of Health, will share the status of our five regionally operated long-term care homes. But just over a week ago, the region, in collaboration with Ontario Health Central Region, struck a team to support integrated response planning for congregated settings, which includes the 28 long-term care homes across the region, retirement homes, and other group homes within the region of Peel. In partnership with the Central West and Mississauga Halton Linz, Peel Public Health, Peel Paramedics, and our hospital partners at Trillium Health Partners and William Ozer Health System, a Peel-specific plan has been developed to rapidly implement the three focus areas identified by the province, which include aggressive testing, screening and surveillance, managing outbreaks and spread, the growing and growing our heroic long-term care workforce. To date, through this collaborative response, the group has focused on addressing staffing and personal protective equipment shortages, infection prevention and control needs, and providing urgent medical coverage through virtual care modalities. In addition, and most importantly, the group continues to triage priority long-term care and retirement home settings in need of testing for COVID-19. Teams such as Peel Paramedics are mobilized daily to conduct testing. Since April 11th, paramedics have completed over 1,500 swabs across long-term care and retirement homes in Peel. And under a new provincial di directive, they will lead the testing of residents and staff in all 28 homes, as well as throughout our retirement and group homes as necessary. This work is under the guidance of Peel Public Health, and you will hear from Dr. Lowe, our MOH, shortly. Like seniors, 
Our homeless population is particularly vulnerable at this time. In response, the region has mobilized to develop an innovative program that pulls together regional health and human services, as well as other healthcare providers to address the social, housing, and medical needs of this population. By greatly enhancing shelter capacity using hotels, physical distancing has been, able, has been enabled and the risk of COVID spread has been reduced. Through the development of an isolation and recovery program, those at highest risk who are self-isolating are supported with additional care services, and those who contract COVID-19 are cared for at a separate location. Thankfully, the number testing positive in our homeless population is currently low. Commissioner Sheehy will speak to the report on the agenda regarding, regarding funding for both this program and the community response table. Next slide. While we are still in the thick of dealing with the impacts of COVID-19 pandemic, we are already planning on what comes next and how we continue to best support the evolving needs of our community. This includes planning about how to demobilize our, region, our emergency response, ramp up our regional services, and redesign and innovate based on our learning. This will take time and we will ensure and we will ensure that our road to recovery is done in a measured, deliberate and phased manner. We look forward to reporting back to Council on this work. And finally, we know that this emergency will have a significant impact on economies across the globe and Peel will not be immune. To help mitigate the financial impact on our budget, we are actively monitoring for economic stimulus opportunities. As mentioned in the financial report on the COVID section of this agenda, we expect the federal government to provide direct support to municipalities. While there have not been any specific announcements by the federal government in this regard, it is anticipated that infrastructure funding programs will be one of the tools that will be implemented to help prop up the Canadian economy. We will continue to look for opportunities that may be available and update council accordingly. Last slide. I want to end today by, by coming back to our regional staff. Many are putting themselves in harm's way. Many are working long hours and all are doing so with their own personal co concerns top of mind. I am consistently impressed with their determination, their willingness to go the extra mile and their ability to adapt and rise to every challenge put in front of them. But most of all, I'm impressed with the caring, respectful way they're treating each other, our partners across the community, and those we aim to serve. They are truly our superheroes. And thank you to Council's unrelenting support for our employees. With that, I am happy to take questions. Nancy, thank you. Before I go to our list, I'm so glad you did acknowledge our heroes who are on the screen, the frontline workers, that we'd be lost without them, and we know they put themselves in harm's way on behalf of helping others. So very good that you acknowledge them. But what I am going to say again, because the public wouldn't be aware, apart from our staff, the great work you do, Nancy, what Lawrence Lowe has done, Dr. Remarkable, but I'm going to single out the three mayors again who know at 5 o'clock every day, I think other than Easter was the only day we might not have had a chat, we convene and their constituents would not know it, but I've got to single out Mayor Crombie, Mayor Brown, and Mayor Thompson, because most of the time spent with their questions, their inquiries, looking after their seniors, et cetera, et cetera, and it takes up an hour after I'm sure they've already spent 12 hours working and more hours to come after that. So the public otherwise wouldn't see it, but I see it, and I've got to thank them from the cooperative approach and, and how they've just done all they can for their staff, for their residents, for their seniors, et cetera, and I wanted their taxpayers and their constituents to know that. With that, I go to my list. Councillor Santos. Thank you, um, through you, Chair. Uh, can, uh, just wanted to actually say thank you to all regional staff, but also to acknowledge the Community Response Task Force. It's been really great to have um, Mikkel Marr, who is our City of Brampton representative, um, on the task force participating. He provides us with regular updates um, and is able, when, when other agencies in Brampton want to participate on the Community Response Task Force, he is able to very quickly connect 
with them. So I just wanted to applaud uh, you guys for um, being collaborative with, with the task force and having our municipalities represented at the table. Thank you very much. Councillor Raz. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, I know we're going to get into a lot more details of some of the other issues a little bit later, but I just wanted to give a shout out to all of the regional staff who are doing a, a great job, whether it's our, our frontline healthcare workers, paramedics, uh, long term care homes, all the way through to our IT folks that are making uh, local government work. So I just want to say thank you, and uh, we're all in this together. Well said, and thank you. Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I too would like to thank our staff for all the great work that they've been doing and, and uh, putting their lives at risk as well being out there. Um, I know that I've had a lot of positive feedback from my community and I would especially like to thank Dr. Lowe for all the great work that he's been doing and keeping us all informed and, and updated on what's happening. Um, I just want to raise something and I don't know if this is a time, but I'm just trying to figure out where to do it and how to do it because it's a real concern for me. I had a call this morning from one of our doctors in our community and we're talking about frontline workers and we're talking about how wonderful they are and how much we appreciate them and how much they they are doing for us. But uh, Mr. Chair and I, I don't know where we, uh, I'm just trying to use any forum that I possibly can to address this because the doctors are very concerned about the fact that the, the province has asked them to see uh, patients at different times, stay late in their office, do the, um, the um, video conferencing and that with patients. And a lot of the doctors have been doing it. So they've been working in clinics and they've been working um, late hours in their office, <clears throat> just seeing their patients. And now the, the province is not wanting to pay them. So they haven't, well, they're delaying in, in getting, they're being delayed with the, the payments to the doctors they're not happy. And I know that um, some of the doctors have reached out to the um, to their association. Um, and I don't know where we, um, I don't know, I, I don't know what we can do, but I certainly think that this is very, it's a serious um, problem that we have because I continue to hear that we don't have enough doctors, we don't have enough nurses and they're bringing retirees and, and, and that, and here we are. Um, that the province is treating the doctors in this fashion, and it's really not very good. So I, I don't know. I'm just putting it out there. Thank you, and it's come up with others, and I think some of the mayors has mentioned it at 5 o'clock as well. I don't know, because I think you've said it yourself. I'm not sure there's anything we can do um, because it's a provincial mandate, but I will throw it out to the staff who've heard the inquiry. Does anybody have a thought on that that can help us out? Through the chair, it's Nancy. Um, so thank you very much, Councillor Groves, for that uh, comment. What we can do is we do sit on tables with Ontario Health Central Region, as well as with our LIM partners. I'm certain we can take those comments back and drive them through that, that, um, that table. And I also see that the Commissioner of Health, Kathy, would like to add to that question. So the first thing is we will bring the back, bring that comment back to our provincial our provincial table, and then Kathy, if you want to go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you, Nancy. Uh, through you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Groves. Yes, uh, Dr. Lowe and his counterparts meet regularly um, with uh, the province as well uh, through a lot of his networks. Um, so we appreciate your advocacy both for our frontline workers and for the physicians. Um, so certainly we will take that back because as you're aware, um, provincial direction is changing daily. Um, so we can certainly um, try to advocate to, um, to support our physicians. Thank you. Thank you very much. But I'm, I'm trying to find something a little stronger and I don't know. And I understand you'll take this back to, that, to the committee. But I, I think that a message needs to be to the Minister of Health and the, the, the Premier himself. I see him every day and I watch his, uh, his um, press conferences and, and I continue to hear this. And so when I hear my doctor saying, uh, we're just not gonna be seeing anybody anymore, that concerns me because um, we're hearing also from the, uh, the health experts that um, they're, they're not sure how long this thing is gonna last. And if we're gonna have our doctors not 
um, not working because of the way they've been, they're being treated by the province of Ontario. I'm sorry, but I have a real problem with that. So I don't know if we require um, some kind of a motion to send to the Premier or to the Minister of Health or Mr. Chair, you write something. I, I have no idea. But it, it really concerns me when I hear my doctor saying, uh, you know what, we're not going to be seeing any patients anymore if this is the way we're being treated. Councillor Groves, well said. The clerk advises me that perhaps, as you've heard from staff, the best we can do at the present time is refer it back to the tables that are in discussions and have them report back on the very, very well put concern that you've placed before us. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think we need to send something out to all the MPPs in in um, in, in our region, both in the city of Brampton, Mississauga, and, and Caledon, so that they get on this and they advocate on behalf of the doctors. Thank you. Thank you, and, and perhaps when we hear what comes back from those tables, um, all of the above will be assessed and we'll decide what course of action we take if, if the satisfactory question isn't answered appropriately. Uh, thank you. With that, McClurk has advised me, uh, Councillor Sinclair perhaps is the phrase here is trying to put up his hand. Uh, Councillor Sinclair, I hope I'm acknowledging you. Uh, is there something you wished to add? I understand IT is trying to help Councillor Sinclair. I'll try one more time. Ian, can you hear me? Okay, I will continue to leave that with our friends in IT. And next on my list, Mayor Crombie. I want to thank Nancy. I want to thank her team. Just want to thank Dr. Lowe and everyone involved. Uh, your, your hard work has been exemplary each and every day, particularly Dr. Lowe and your team in public health. You know, it's a, you are that voice of reassurance and confidence, and we thank you for all you've been doing. Um, I appreciate the presentation, Nancy. I'm familiar with the material, so I'm glad you had the opportunity to brief uh, the rest of Regional Council. But I think most of us now that we see there may be light at the end of the tunnel. The Premier has said he has growing optimism in a few weeks. We could peak and come down the other side. But now the surge is in the long-term care facilities. And out of the 28 long-term care facilities in Peel, 200, there are 270 patients and staff that are COVID positive in 22 of our long-term care facilities. And we also know that most of the, many of the deaths are occurring in the long-term care facilities. In fact, 21 of the 58 have been in LTC homes. So I wonder if um, Nancy, or shall we wait maybe till Dr. Lowe speaks, can address um, the urgency and the assistance that our long-term care homes are receiving from our respective hospitals, Trium Health Partners or William Osler with respect to those SWAT teams the Premier discussed. How else can we get the resources they need to get through this crisis, which is really surging like wildfire through the long-term care facilities now? Um, and largely invisibly, frankly, because uh, even in my press conference yesterday, wasn't it one question raised by the press uh, on the status of the long-term care facilities and uh, the status of those patients. So um, I, I'm happy to wait till Dr. Lowe makes his presentation, but you know, this is my greatest concern right now. I think that I see a light at the end of the tunnel with respect to community transmission. People are fairly compliant. And I think in a couple of weeks, we could be coming down the other side if we stay the course right now and continue to practice that physical distancing but my heart goes out to our seniors, the very population we were trying to protect. And we see now that there is a surge in those facilities caring for our elderly. So is there any, should we continue to ask for more resources from the province, from our hospitals? Uh, what more can be done there? That's really my comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Crombie. I think you've perfectly prepped Dr. Lowe to speak to it and also come out, uh, Commissioner Granger uh, when she's on later on my list. So with that, I will try one more time uh, to reach out to Councillor Sinclair if he can hear me and if he still wished to speak. Councillor Sinclair? Okay, we're still trying our best to sort that out. Uh, with that, I believe I need receipt of the presentation from Council, uh, uh, and, sorry, from Chief Administrative Officer Interim Nancy Polzanelli. Do I have receipt? 
Any objections to receipt? Perhaps the better way to frame it. Thank you to the clerk. Seeing no uh, objections, we've moved receipt of that and thank you, which brings us to 8.2. COVID-19 update and presentation on disease, epidemiology, and modeling for Peel region. An oral presentation by Dr. Lawrence Lowe, Acting Medical Officer of Health, and Manali Vadia, Manager Infection Prevention and Surveillance. Dr. Lowe. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, uh, Council. Thank you very much for your kind words uh, and certainly your continuing support of uh, Peel Public Health's response together with the rest of the region uh, around COVID-19. Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll give my preamble and then try to get to, uh, to Manali's presentation around the modeling, uh, and then after which I will speak uh, uh, to greater length around the, uh, the immediate need in long-term care uh, that uh, Mayor Crombie identified, uh, which I, you know, I, I share, I certainly share her concern and certainly I imagine the, the concern of many around the council chamber um, in, uh, in hoping, you know, certainly to provide some reassurance uh, that significant steps are being taken in an expanded response in those settings. Now, uh, with, with that though, I will launch my preamble and in, in respecting your time, if council will permit me, I will skip uh, the specific sharing of numbers uh, as you saw in the email uh, we sent last night, we do have a new data dashboard which, land, which launched, uh, and that uh, is intended to provide uh, yourselves as well as the greater public uh, with more detailed insights beyond just simple case counts uh, and, and uh, a little bit more analysis there. So I did want to, before going into the models, reinforce what we know and where we are. So as you'll recall, the virus that causes COVID-19 relies on person-to-person -person interactions to spread. And it is for this reason uh, that uh, one thing that is gaining problems in the media known as contact tracing is so important. And I thought it important to share today um, that Peel Public Health engages in contact tracing like every other public health agency around the world. It is a fundamental component of our response. It's not something new uh, that's just been discovered. Um, our contact tracing teams have been on high alert since the pandemic first emerged in January in China, and they have doggedly tracked down the contacts of every reported case in our region since our own first reported case of positive was identified on March 5th. So I wanted to really provide that context around contact tracing, which I know is gaining a lot of media interest. I also wanted to relate it as well uh, to the physical distancing measures that have been recommended. And really it speaks to why those must stay in place in the short run, uh, at least in the, in the coming weeks and months. Uh, you know, certainly there have been uh, a number of critics who have stated that uh, the steps that uh, you have taken on our recommendations uh, to close and curtail the community uh, suggest there was no plan to respond. But in fact, the opposite is actually true. Uh, this is the plan when you have a totally susceptible population faced with a disease that masquerades as mild and spreads easily from person to person, but which can cause severe results for our elderly, the unwell, and also sometimes seemingly at random. Without a cure or vaccine, distancing is pretty much all you've got. It allows us to shrink our circles, limit interactions, and slow spread. And then incidentally, uh, it also makes it easier to contact trace because if you've shrunk, shrunk the circle, it's easier to keep track of who you've been in contact with. Now, I do recognize that other jurisdictions have been able to limit interactions without closures and curtailments, and they benefit from geographic advantages, technology, or different sociocultural contexts. But by my humble estimation, I think Peel and Canada have put us on a good trajectory, which also re reflects and respects our context. We are a dynamic, diverse, free society with strong relationships to the United States and the growing crisis, as you know, there, um, and also to the four corners of the earth. And like every other jurisdiction, we have had to thread a needle between two extremes. We have had to hold off either a wildfire that spreads far and wide, which might overwhelm hospitals and cause significant suffering and lasting trauma for our frontline healthcare workers. But we have also equally chosen not to do a total fire break with a complete prolonged shutdown that can also impact health and well-being through disruption to care and services, lost jobs, loneliness, and isolation. We have tried to aim for a controlled burn, a measured, limited circulation of the virus that tries to balance the disruption and disease uh, on either extreme. And so I say this while also fully recognizing that members of our community have, have lost loved ones uh, to COVID-19. I also know that many are grappling with the impacts of the recent changes to their lives and our thoughts are with them. And to a large extent, we have to remember that there are no winners. 
when a new disease erupts like this onto the world stage. And for this reason, we must continue to lift each other up, you know, as we're truly all in this together. But I want to be very clear. We are not done with COVID-19 in Peel or in the greater Toronto area. The pandemic has begun to show its face in our community and our challenge is now unfolding on two fronts. So we are starting to see the pace of community cases hopefully slowing and that's thanks to the measures that uh, Council took uh, together with the province and the federal government uh, during the golden period in late March. But we must keep that up because our hospitals are continuing to see increasing numbers of hospitalizations and ICU admissions and we are still continuing to see deaths of COVID-19 uh, complications in our community. And as, uh, as has been said earlier, most critically, we are seeing spread and severity in various congregate settings across the region, especially in our seniors' homes. So I know our Commissioner of Health Services uh, will provide an update on our regionally operated long-term care homes. And as CAO Polsonelli stated, we have moved into an expanded response, which I'll talk a little bit if there's time after the modeling presentation uh, and really are coordinating with Ontario Health Central Region, hospital and healthcare partners, and our long-term care sector on the priority areas described by CAO Polsonelli around screening, outbreak control, and workforce. But I wanted to be very clear that we must continue our current measures for the moment. As I've said, it's all we've got. It will help to keep community spread under control and support our ongoing efforts, both to contact trace within the community and also arrest and interrupt transmission that is taking place in our senior and congregate settings. So in thinking about the path forward, uh, modeling is a tool that can help to provide, shed some light, it is by no means fully predictive, but I have brought with me uh, Manali Varia, our manager of infection prevention and surveillance, who will now present uh, an outlook on modeling data for the region appeal. So I'll pass it over to you to Manali to, uh, to share with council uh, what we have gleaned uh, for the future. Thank you very much, and through the chair, thank you very much for the opportunity to share this information on the COVID-19 situation in Peel with Council. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, this has just been described, but just taking you back to the end of January, beginning of December, where we learned about the outbreak of the novel coronavirus, not previously identified in humans in, in Wuhan, China. So we're all familiar with uh, the COVID-19 illness now. And it was important for us to learn and follow early on what was going on in preparation for what we might see here with importation of disease. And it informs some of the public health measures and the modeling that, uh, that was looked at. The information on this slide describes the findings from the first approximately 70,000 cases in China. And as Dr. Lowe has described, we know from that that it's a respiratory disease transmitted by droplets due to, uh, to close unprotected contact with an infected individual, um, typically when someone coughs or sneezes. Airborne spread has not been reported, but we know it's possible if there are certain medical procedures that are done that generate aerosols. We also learned that the incubation period, which is the time from infection to becoming ill, was approximately five days, but could range up to 14 days. And we learned that people are communicable or infectious when symptomatic, although there is some knowledge that people could be infection, uh, infectious and very mild, so pre-symptomatic. In terms of common symptoms, in most cases, we we uh, learned that fever and dry cough were the most common. There are other symptoms, and, and this is emerging, uh, but these weren't as commonly reported out of the China outbreak. In terms of the clinical presentation, 80%, as Dr. Lowe mentioned, were mild, moderate. That includes pneumonia, 14% um, severe, and 6% critical enough to require oxygen. And the case fatality rate, which is the percentage of deaths among cases, was around 0.7% outside of Wuhan. And I'll come back to this. Next slide, please. So in the absence of a vaccine or treatment, the ability for China to control their epidemic was in those traditional public health tools. So the border screenings and case detection and contact management, physical distancing, um, which we have all been speaking of, and things like hand washing and making sure people stay home when sick. And these are the tools that we also have been using. Next slide. 
So four months later, this slide is a display of the global dashboard on COVID-19 as of April 19th, and it shows that there have been approximately 2.3 million cases of COVID-19 globally, over 163,000 deaths, and almost all countries have been affected. And as we know, the World Health Organization declared that COVID-19 a pandemic on March 11th, 2020. Next slide. So just more locally, in Canada, the provinces are at different spots in the outbreak, and BC, who started their outbreak earlier than us, um, have peaked and they've seen a reduction in their cases. This particular image is the provincial data from the recent epidemiological report showing Ontario's epidemic curve. And this is one of the tools that public health practitioners use to understand an outbreak. This curve shows the number of cases reported and that's on the y-axis by the episode date and what that means it's the date of onset of symptoms or specimen collection date if we don't have a symptom onset date and so you can see that from the shape of this curve in Ontario we saw a quick rise in cases until about mid-March and then there was some stabilization but at present it's too soon to say that Ontario's curve is peaking or has peaked next slide please This graph is of COVID-19 probable and confirmed cases and deaths in Peel. For more recent data, this is presented by date reported to public health. So I'll just explain. So the green line on the top represents cases. And what you see here is that since Peel's first case reported in early March, the first few cases were primarily travel related and among close contacts. And then we saw an increase in cases at the end of March, where we started seeing evidence of community transmission. And then you can see that in the past few days, so this graph goes until April 19th, we've seen a large increase in the number of cases. And this is due to increases in testing. Um, we've seen mass testing in our long-term care facilities, and that peak is due to uh, some of the cases, the increase in cases that we have seen in our institutions, um, which was mentioned earlier on. In terms of the trajectory, I think it's been mentioned. Um, however, among community cases, we have seen some stabilization, but we have seen that increase in institutional settings. The blue line at the bottom represents those with COVID-19 who have died. And all public health units are reporting deaths among cases, regardless of whether people died from COVID-19 or with COVID-19. Next slide, please. This figure is the epidemiological profile of COVID-19 cases in Peel with data from April 16th. We will have a new report available tomorrow on Friday. So what I'll just highlight here is that of the total cases, um, we're starting to see um, a little bit of an increase in, in females compared to males. This is partly because uh, we are seeing an increase of reports around healthcare workers and healthcare settings, and many of those are, are female. The median age of cases is 54. Half of our cases are below this age and half above. When we look at hospitalization data, the median age is slightly higher at 59. And then at looking at those who have died, the median age is 77, so an older population. We are reporting on recovered cases, but I will mention that these are data extracted from a reportable disease system. And so we do know that this number is quite a bit higher as we tend to count recovery as those whose symptoms have resolved and it's been 14 days since the symptoms developed. So um, we are working towards uh, improving that number. Next slide, please. This graph shows the distribution of Peel COVID-19 cases by age group. And so what I'll just point out is the red bars here represent the age distribution in our, our overall population as a reference point. And so for example, approximately 24% of Peel residents are 19 years of age or younger. The blue bars are the percent of COVID-19 cases by age group. And what you see here is that disease, that this disease affects all age groups one third of the cases are within the 40 to 59 age group. The yellow bars that you have represent the data that we have on hospitalizations and the black bars are the deaths among those with COVID-19. And you can see that the 
percentage, uh, the 61 percent of deaths among 80, uh, the eight, those 80 years of age and older, does represent many of the deaths that are occurring in long-term care. We do see that um, while these severe outcomes do increase with age, we are seeing hospital admissions among most age groups. So it does affect all ages. Next slide, please. So I know that there is much interest in the modeling information. So I will be sharing some of the work that we've done to apply models that have been done by colleagues from the University of Toronto and the University of Guelph who we're working with. And I'll just mention that there are many types of models. So some that do look to make projections of new cases and then others like this one that look at the potential impact of interventions. And so in this case, the interventions that we are looking at are uh, include testing, um, so improved detection, and our case and contact management, or it includes the closures that facilitated physical distancing. The modeling work that was done by this group allows us to see the potential of the outbreak, and then uh, we'll be able to visually show how various public health measures can interrupt transmission of COVID-19. And the model has allowed us to look at several scenarios. So one is around fixed durations. So this is where we're looking at if the interventions, so enhanced testing or restrictive measures, were in place for one month, how much of an impact would that have? Or what about six months or 18 months? The second is dynamic interventions, where we turn the interventions on and off based on predetermined triggers. So in this model, that threshold used was 200 COVID-19 cases in ICU based on numbers around what the ICU capacity in Ontario is. And through the model, you put in the heavier public health measures when you see the number of ICU cases increase past capacity. If that number goes below threshold, then we can ease up on those measures. And then if, again, if the cases rise back above the threshold, then the intervention is implemented again. So you get a cycling. Just to emphasize that a bit more, some have used the parallel here of a, of a light switch versus a dimmer. So the light switch is the fixed intervention, so turning things on and off. And the dynamic is more like a dimmer where you're making adjustments based on what is needed. Next slide, please. So all of the models uh, have assumptions and many of the assumptions in this model were based on what was observed in other countries, including China. And so some of those include uh, recovered individuals remaining immune, deaths that happen in the ICU. And, and we are seeing a little bit that some of these assumptions are uh, may need to be adjusted. Other things are, are looking at equal infectivity by age group, differences in severity by outcomes by age and by comorbidity, et cetera. The model also looks at different outcomes like cases, hospitalizations, ICU admissions and deaths. And so I will show you some of those. Next slide, please. Uh, so some of the examples I'll show you uh, are in the coming slides. Just to, um, to reiterate that the numbers are, are not necessarily um, what we should be looking at in, at face value as it's based on the assumptions from the China experience. But um, what is useful is to look at the, the anticipated impact of the measures. And that's the main takeaway in the shape of, of the curve. Next slide, please. So this first chart looks at the model total cases in Peel. And on this bar chart, the y-axis is the total number of potential cases and the black bar represents the base case where we would have uh, limited to no interventions and what this estimates is that about 50 percent of Peel's population would be affected if, and if we put in measures for a fixed one month and then go back to normal um, so one month of enhanced testing and some physical distancing the model says that we would see a reduction of about 16,000 cases, so 2% there, and that's the that blue bar, the first blue bar. If we keep the measures in place longer, we see more of an impact, so 56% reduction for six months of enhanced testing and some physical distancing. And then under the scenario where we ramp up and ramp down our, our measures, so that was the dynamic measures, and that was based on the ICU bed threshold, Based on the modeling estimates, we would see a significant reduction in the total number of cases in the outbreak. Next slide, please. So this chart shows these data, the same data visually, looking 
looking at the total new cases per day over a two year period. And that black line is the base case, which shows that the outbreak potential to spread through the population at the peak, the modeling is estimating 15,000 new cases in that per day. One month of public health measures makes a small impact. However, there are two things that you can see from this graph that would happen the longer the interventions are kept in place. So we would see a reduction in the total number of daily cases at the peak, which is important when we think about health system capacity. And then you can see that we see a delay in the peak by about a year, um, which provides us time for effective treatment or for a vaccine, for example, to be made. The yellow line at the bottom, um, it's hard to see and I'll show you in the next slide. It shows the dynamic measures scenario, which we can zoom in on the next slide, please. And so you'll remember that we spoke about using a threshold to decide on when to increase and de decrease the measures. And you can see that effect here. So when disease transmission increases, we will eventually reach the threshold of Peel's proportion of 200 COVID-19 cases in the ICU, um, at which point we need to put in place more testing and more restrictive measures. As this brings us below the threshold again, we can think about lifting those measures again, and that's why you see these oscillations or cycling over time. Next slide, please. So, so this is the same concept, looking at hospitalized non-ICU cases in Peel. So the black line again is the base case of no to limited interventions, which shows the outbreak severity. Um, and at the peak, the modeling estimated 4,000 hospitalizations. One month of public health measures, so the blue line, makes little impact and you can see that this would not be manageable for our hospital system. The dashed line is six months and it shows a significant reduction in the height of, a, height of the curve and it shows um, the delay in the peak by about a year. And so again, the yellow line at the bottom is showing the impact of dynamic measures over a lot longer time frame. And in the next slide, please. You can see by the scale on the y-axis that shows new hospitalized cases. It ranges from zero to 90. And you can see that this is a significant reduction in the total number of modeled hospitalizations. And you can see again the oscillations based on the increasing and decreasing of the, the measures such as the enhanced testing and physical distancing. The next slide is the same graph again, but this time looking at the modeled new deaths in Peel. And so uh, again, the base case is a solid black line and it shows that with no interventions, there are modeled 200 deaths per day at the peak. Um, there's certainly uncertainty in this modeling, which might explain the six month curve. However, visually you can see that under the dynamic scenario, which is the yellow line, um, the daily number of deaths is significantly reduced and that in the model ranges from zero to three daily. So these were some of the modeling slides that have allowed us to think about um, how to plan and understand and what, what might be expected of us. And in speaking with some of the, the modelers that were responsible for, for doing this work, they are currently doing some work to calibrate or update this model in relation to adjusting some of those assumptions. So for example, the modeling work did not previously anticipate the role of the clusters and, and long-term care outbreaks that we've seen in Ontario over the past few weeks. Next slide, please. Uh, sorry, next slide. So the next three slides are describing what we have seen borne out in, in our outbreak. And uh, this slide is the provincial timeline outlining the public health measures put into place over the past several months, including the March 17th declaration of the emergency uh, enclosure of public spaces. So restricting mass gatherings to 50 people. Um, not mentioned here is, uh, is some of the additional measures put in place by the municipalities and the region. Next slide. So just thinking about the impacts of these measures, these images are from the Google Mobility Reports for Ontario, which look at anonymized and aggregate, uh, aggregated location data from cell phones. And they provide a bit of an understanding of what the measures did to support safe physical distancing. 
And so from the time of school of the school closures and the provincial order that were in mid-March, what you can see throughout most of these graphs is an overall decreased mobility and interactions compared to baseline. And so, for example, that includes an overall about 50% reduction in retail and recreation, as well as workplace travel, um, as well as 60% reduction in transit use. And while grocery and pharmacy is still considered an essential, you can see that there's also a decline in visits there. Next slide, please. One other way to see the impact of these measures of physical, say physical distancing and our aggressive case and contact management is to look at something called the doubling time of cases. And so that looks at how quickly, for example, do we go from two cases to four cases or four to eight and so on. If we are interrupting transmission, we want to be able to see it take longer to double our cases. So here we have a dark blue line, um, which shows the total cumulative cases of COVID-19 plotted by the day since the first day, uh, first case was reported. And what you see here is the initial trajectory of perhaps um, eyeballing, perhaps a doubling every two days to abend in the curve showing a slowing of the outbreak to about three days. And this was up till April 14th and, and we, are continuing to keep this up to date. But what we are seeing is this bending of the curve. So, um, so the measures are working. Next slide, please. So just to wrap up, uh, the key messages to date as mentioned by Dr. Lowe, the measures like physical distancing, isolating cases, uh, our uh, ability to quarantine contacts, we have seen that they are effective. We've seen results of that. And we can see that due to the efforts of all Peel residents um, with physical distancing, um, we are seeing the, that effectiveness, but we do still need to continue. We're not seeing that we're at the peak just yet. Um, so these measures, the other piece that, um, that has been noted is that me these measures may need to continue um, to some degree. And that is to continue to flatten the curve overall be able to avoid the burden of the healthcare system and to make sure that everyone who needs to be to, to get care um, is able to do so. Um, but also to delay the peak, to buy some time for effective treatment or development of a vaccine. And, and next slide, please. And so our uh, continued and emergence, emerging priorities do tend to be that continued case finding and contact management. We need to continue the testing and detection. We do need to stop these localized clusters and inter interrupt transmission, particularly in those most vulnerable settings. And in terms of planning for the long term, uh, the continued physical distancing is extremely important, but still thinking about how to minimize the unintended consequences and impacts um, of these important public health measures. Uh, and with that, um, we thank you for your support and your questions around the data and for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you. With that, I have a list of questioners from Manali and Lawrence. My list is Groves, Sato, Brown, Vicente, Sinclair, and Thompson. Councillor Groves. Mr. Chair, I'm going to hold mine for the next presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Sato. Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you both for the presentation. That was uh, extremely interesting and helpful information. Um, I'm not sure uh, which of you can answer this question, but I heard both of you say that the physical distancing um, is, is one of the more important ways, uh, things that we need to continue to look at. And also, um, it's on this last slide, continued physical distancing while minimizing the impacts of the measures. So looking ahead, I, I mean, I think I'd said yesterday in our council meeting that to me, as we move out of this, um, we cannot become complacent that the physical distancing, I think, is, uh, is going to continue for an extended period of time. And I think it's going to be more important than ever for us to stress that. Having said that, um, Dr. Lowe, maybe you can answer this. Um, why was physical distancing not made an order 
by the province of Ontario. It was not made an order by the MOH provincially, and you also, as the MOH for Peel, did not make physical distancing an order. That um, it's only a recommendation. And my fear is that with it just being a recommendation, as we move forward, people will start to become complacent and they will start ignoring it. And we will be right back where we were a couple of weeks ago. So thank you very much, Councillor Sato, for the question. And through you, Mr. Chair, uh, you certainly recognize uh, that uh, physical distancing is a, is a critical component, uh, whether it's uh, right now in the, in the critical phase, which is the stay at home, uh, ideally as much as possible. Uh, certainly um, uh, self-isolation if someone is not feeling well at all. And then in the future, what that looks like, whether it's ensuring that there's a two meter separation in various service settings, you know, reduced seating or occupancy. I mean, the, those are all the pieces, as you know, that we've put in place around um, essential uh, services, et cetera. The question, uh, certainly, Councillor, around um, recommendations versus orders uh, has been something that has come up throughout uh, the course of this response. Um, and I do agree with you that uh, that complacency risks our success. Um, I think part of the challenge with orders uh, has really also spoken to the uh, enforcement challenges uh, that we've seen around these uh, around these uh, pieces. Uh, we rely on a certain level of civic uh, mindedness and uh, and um, commitment uh, to serving the greater communal community good. Um, and to a large extent, we have been very fortunate that many people have complied with uh, recommendations to physically distance, to close, to all these other all the other various pieces that have been put in place to the physical uh, physical distance. Um, one thing we're always weighing is whether we place an order and uh, for which we are not able to or not logistically, it's not logistically feasible uh, to enforce versus, uh, you know, to, to make a strong recommendation and, and trust that people will do the right thing. Um, overall, I think uh, I think it's critical right now. It, it, it's, it's, um, it's worked right now for the time being, but I agree with you in the future as there becomes fatigue around the measures that have been put into place. There may need to be a stronger message that that gets delivered. So uh, it's something that we're constantly monitoring, and, and I thank you, Councillor, for the question. Okay, thank you. Um, my other question, and I and I guess it's more of a comment, but um, you referred to um, the amount of pe the number of people, because the testing is also identifying people who are not showing any symptoms. Um, just as an example, and I was giving this to council yesterday at my long-term care facility, they just completed um, a large focus testing and um, they jumped from 23 positive to 43 positive. But of that number, 35% were asymptomatic. So um, they would not have been identified unless the extensive testing had taken place. Now, the good news is that there were 115 that were testing negative. And then I look at the other side of the bad news is that uh, to date we have lost 10 um, residents in that home to, uh, to COVID. But, you know, I, I guess that pointed out to me as well that when you have 35% of those tested positive, that we're not showing any symptoms, it's a really strong message to send out to the public that, you know, even though we're getting uh, perhaps lower numbers or even with testing, we're getting the higher numbers, the fact is that people are obviously walking around with no symptoms. And the importance that you may not show it, but you could be spreading it at the same time. Uh Thank you, Councillor Sato, for that uh, observation. And uh, through you, the chair, that's absolutely correct. And that's uh, part of the, the reason and the challenge. Many people, especially uh, in the elderly population, have um, present with atypical symptoms. And then even for uh, the evidence that has been shown uh, in other jurisdictions and here in Canada is that sometimes uh, people have what are called subclinical or pre-symptomatic uh, presentations where they're they're essentially like it's really really difficult to tell if they have the the condition and so it really speaks to steps that have been taken i, I can also share that in many other jurisdictions around the world i believe for example 
in uh, Germany, uh, they have started to look at uh, broad population uh, surveys and testing to determine how far uh, this has spread because uh, the, the, um, the prevailing thought is that this may be uh, the, the disease may be certainly mild in many people, uh, but perhaps more widespread than uh, than actually has been observed through the current testing regimens. So one, one final question. Um, beca because of the results that were shown in the long-term care facilities where, of course, people are close together and um, it's it's more difficult to, uh, to self-isolate, but um, do we have sufficient test uh, testing um, apparatus and ability to do more widespread testing on an extension of the population as we start moving ahead uh, to see if we can identify people who are basically, you know, perhaps walking around carrying the virus but not showing symptoms. Yes, thank you, Councillor Sato, for the question and through the chair. Uh, at this time, actually, the, the, there is uh, increased testing capacity that has been brought online, and a lot of that capacity is being directed to uh, long-term care at this time. I would imagine that once we get things under control in long-term care, uh, there may be a, a broader push uh, to examine things in the community. Certainly, what we would want to see is something along the lines of what they have in Germany, uh, where it's serologic testing, which is blood testing, which would also help to determine immunity rather than whether the person just uh, has the disease or not. So uh, it, it's an excellent question, Councillor Sato, and, and thank you for it. Hey, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. That's all my questions. I just want to uh, pass along my, my thanks. That's a very impressive presentation that you just gave us. And um, the modeling is certainly something that um, that I think our residents are very interested in. They have a lot of questions, and uh, I, I, you know, public health is doing an amazing job. So, thank you to everyone who's uh, out there on those front lines. And, and Councillor Seda, thank you for that. A real reflection of the caliber of staff we have up here at the region. So I appreciate your acknowledging that, Mayor Brown. Just take the mic off, and um, similar to the concerns raised by Councillor Sato and. Mayor Crombie, before, um, my biggest concern, Dr. Lowe, right now is the state of the long-term care homes. And as I've said on our five o'clock calls, and I'll share with um, regional council, is the correspondence I'm receiving from family members and caregivers in long-term care settings um, has me worried. Um, you, get, you get one picture from the administration that tends to be more confident, and you get another picture um, from family members and you know I, I was speaking the Minister of Long-Term Care and the Premier and, and Dr. Kevin Smith about this and, and they were candid to, to say that in homes around Ontario sometimes those emails from family members were the initial warning signs that caused further investigation and more often than not there is um, a level of trouble to, to the concerns that you hear from family members and so I want to flag that you know, there's a, a few locations in Peel that we get those warning signs. Uh, uh, Holland Christian Homes is an example of that, where there's uh, 49 um, individuals who have tested um, positive. I'm pleased to hear that the hospital has, I understand, taken 15 of, of them in. But, um, you know, I, I guess, Dr. Lowe, what I'd be um, interested in hearing is what more can we do? Like, I, right, I know right now there's a level of, awareness and and uh, and going to check in but what more can we do and have you looked at what other public healths are, are are doing i understand that in some public health districts um that there's hospital staff that, that have been reassigned to long-term care homes i noticed the premier yesterday said that he's calling in the canadian forces to help and i'm curious to know what that looked like in quebec when they had the canadian forces on the ground Will there be any Canadian Forces medics who can help um, uh, in Peel Region? Uh, do we have to make that request uh, formally? Um, and what I think would be to the benefit of Regional Council is that if we could have a report showing um, what the staff shortages are in all public and private homes, so we have a, a line of sight into this. Because we're hearing one thing um, from family members, but I, I want to know what the actual stats are. Is the staffing truly down by a third? Um, how dramatic is a shortage and, 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 what do, and what does it mean? And I know we have an update, the number of deaths in long-term care facilities, but what I'd really like to see 
is number of, of cases in, e in, in, in each facility, because then we can compare it to where it was a week ago um, to get a better sense of, do we have a handle on this and um, um, and whether there should be more dramatic actions that, that, that we're taking. Thank you very much, Mayor Brown. I'm, go I'm gonna start uh, to answer sort of some of the broad parts of your question, and then I'm, I may pass it on to um, uh, both Manali as well as uh, as uh, around the data pieces, um, and then uh, to Commissioner Granger, who I know has some perspective on this as well. Um, so, you know, certainly I, I don't want to overstate the important uh, work that is being done in uh, long-term care centers at this point in time. Uh, and certainly, as I mentioned, it has been a, a coordinated approach, a whole of healthcare a sector approach. Uh, certainly, public health, uh, with our expertise, has really been focused. Uh, on the outbreak, uh, outbreak and testing aspects of things, making sure that we're um, assisting with the testing, we're testing, directing the outbreak response, and partnering with our hospitals around the infection control aspects. Uh, certainly, a lot of the staffing and PPE issues that you've identified have been taken on by other members of that coordinated uh, piece around things like Ontario Health. Um, and Ontario Health has been very focused on the staffing supports, and as I understand it, with the Canadian Forces. Uh, um, approach, uh, you know, and th this is me sort of speaking from my understandings from what I, what I hear from them. Uh, it's meant to provide support for some of the um, non-care functions of the home so that the, uh, the, the long-term care staff can focus, I, as I understand it, on, on the provision of care, uh, which is the critical piece. Um, and certainly, obviously, ensuring that there's adequate personal protective equipment and supply. Uh, as mentioned as well, we do have hospitals together with our teams, uh, you know, having uh, what we call rapid response, I guess what the Premier has been calling uh, SWAT teams, uh, you know, enter homes to essentially ensure that there is support around infection prevention and control aspects, et cetera. Um, but, uh, but I mean, I, I think there is a th th there is a response that is firing on all cylinders, and I would I would underscore, if anything, my my personal uh, conviction, you know, for that the long term care sector has uh, has had many challenges, uh, you know, certainly even prior to the the course of this pandemic, and uh, and I really would hope, um, you know, we certainly in the future uh, during the recovery phase of things, think a bit uh, think a bit more about how we keep our seniors. Uh, well and safe uh, in these in these various settings, uh, particularly in the future. But in terms of the data pieces, I was going to pass that on to um, Manali to answer because I know she has some ideas around uh, how we how we might be able to furnish that. A, a lot of that data, especially on staffing, would have to come from partners. It wouldn't come from us in public health necessarily. Um, but uh, but I think Manali has insights into that, and then uh, Manali will pass it on to Commissioner Granger to provide perhaps some some additional insight from her experience with. Uh, with the sector and the work that has been uh, that has been done there uh, in preparation previously as well. So, Manali. Thanks, Dr. Lowe, and uh, thank you um, through the chair, um, Mayor Brown, um, for the question. Just around the the data piece. Um, so, before the mass testing um, directive was uh, was put out by the province, um, one case of COVID-19, whether in a staff or resident, is considered an outbreak, and and there are aggressive measures put into place. We are um, we are certainly committed to reporting on the number of resident and staff cases. So we do know um, we're working with Ontario Health and other partners to be able to um, synthesize all of the different pieces around what testing is being done. And um, so what we will be committing to um, very shortly on the on the public facing dashboard is around the total uh, the outbreaks and the number of resident cases by facility so we can all be able to um, to monitor um, what is happening in each of these institutions okay mayor brown thank you uh, oh, oh sorry Kat. Oh. will it be possible to, to to get that data to regional council uh, Chair, Chair Nika, it's, it's uh, Commissioner Granger. Um, can I speak? Abs absolutely. Um, so through you, Chair, um, Mayor Brown, thank you for the question. Um, as, as all of you, uh, we are as concerned um, about our staff in um, our long-term care homes and our residents. I wanted to let you know to build on what um, 
our CAO said is that we do have an integrated response table meeting every morning and they've done a thorough needs assessment in all the homes so that they can, um, I can certainly work with them to bring back your information regarding the staffing issue. They certainly look at uh, needs in the homes in terms of uh, infection uh, prevention control, um, PPE surveillance to be able to prioritize the needs across the region. So to your data request about staffing, I can certainly bring that back um, uh, reach out to them, um, the ones from Ontario Health, and bring that information back to you, because um, we are as concerned of you. And as a, one example, at Sheridan Villa, we had um, a, a severe staffing situation on the weekend, and we reached out, and we did have um, some support from our Trillium partners who came to our to our home. And and I'll just note, I appreciate that because otherwise we're we're in the dark. And you know, it's one thing to have a global number, but for us to really have a handle what's happening in 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 our in our municipalities and in our various wards, we you know, it, it, right now we're we're getting feedback and facts from Facebook and from email correspondence constituents. I really want to have the 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 real numbers so we have a a real insight into this. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Vicente. Thank you, Chair. Just a quick question to Dr. Lowe, and uh, obviously this is not a priority, but um, there's been discussion um, in the public realm with regards to the idea of uh, herd immunity and uh, folks who may have had uh, this disease and who uh, have moved on from it. Um, we uh, at the City of Brampton um, Curiously, uh, in the months of December and January, practically every member of council and a lot of uh, members of staff that we speak to on a daily basis uh, were very sick with uh, flu-like symptoms. What is the possibility that um, we may have already had this and didn't even realize it at that very early date? So thank you uh, for the question, Councillor Vicente, and through you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would I would venture that in the December through February period, if you were having uh, colds or flu-like symptoms, uh, you were probably experiencing either uh, an, an infection due to influenza or due to the many other uh, viruses that cause uh, you know the common cold, which can occasion be uh, rather miserable. Um, it's important to note in terms of the question of immunity. Uh, that there are actually four other uh, known coronaviruses that are seasonal um, that uh, actually are responsible for the common cold. Um, the reason why uh, they cause the common cold uh, rather than the severe presentations we see with COVID-19 is because we have over time evolved uh, to, uh, to have some residual partial immunity to these viruses, even if we don't have full immunity to them. And that's why the common cold is so common. Um, and so you you know, get inoculated with one of the common cold viruses during the winter, uh, you feel miserable for five to seven days, and then you uh, you clear the infection. Uh, and that's usually what happens. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing for uh, the coronavirus, uh, evidence is still being uh, studied and developed, um, but there is uh, some suggestion that it may behave in the same way as those viruses, meaning that the immunity is not a full immunity as you would uh, have with something like measles or chickenpox, but perhaps more of a residual or partial immunity that allows you to just deal better with it the next time. And, and it really speaks to the idea that many people have, you know, mild presentations that are similar to the common cold uh, with, with COVID-19. Um, so the idea being that uh, any herd immunity would probably be uh, some sort of residual uh, fleeting immunity that would be lasting over months to years, but it would come back and uh, in the future, but not be as severe of a presentation because it's not brand new novel uh, at that time. At least that's the working hypothesis for a lot of things uh, right now, and certainly the hope with, uh, with uh, as I understand it, what they're developing with a vaccine. Um, but I would say the possibility that you had um, in the future, uh, it, it, the possibility that you may have had things uh, in the um, in January is, is quite remote, uh, at least of it being COVID-19, just because at that time, most of it was still contained uh, to Hubei. I'm going to actually pass it to Manali to speak a little bit about, uh, if I may, uh, serologic studies and, uh, and testing for immunity. So, uh, Manali, could you share a bit about that immune aspect as well? Thanks, Dr. Lowe, and uh, through the chair, thank you, Councillor, for the question. Um, 
So one of the things that we've um, been looking into is is around some of the serological studies. Um, so looking for uh, uh, where there are antibodies. Um, California just recently came out of their outbreak. And so for Santa Clara, they just published a study that um, looked at a selection of their population. And they found that 3 to 4% of, of individuals individuals had um, had immunity. Um, there's been a couple of other studies that have been published uh, in Netherlands, for example, study of blood donors where similar percent, about 3%, were reported. And so I think, um, you know, one of the, the important pieces there is that because of the physical distancing, um, the um, any, any kind of decreases have not been to due to herd immunity, it's because of the measures that that people have taken. So um, so we're still actively watching those serological studies to see um, to see what that impact is. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Councillor Sinclair. Yeah, here I am. I'd like to speak to uh, the oscillating slide model daily new cases in Peel at page 8.2-14. It's the yellow bar, and it's been run out two years. And I'm a little concerned uh, here where the message has been uh, to the public to flatten the curve, and uh, we keep seeing these two-week to one-month extensions to the uh, measures in place. And I have a weird sense that some members of the public may think, well, all, all's going to be well by June and we'll have a nice summer. Whereas this chart fairly says, we're gonna have oscillations running out for at least two years of, of the COVID-19. And the management of COVID-19 is dependent on broad social participation and physical distancing and hygiene practices. And public has to have a real public confidence and trust in the official management of COVID-19 for this to continue. This basically continues uh, the thinking of Councillor Sato. And I'm just concern with what's the problem of maintaining people's confidence if you have off and on again messaging in response to these oscillations? That's my question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question, Councillor Sinclair. Uh, I'm going to um, pass it over to Manali to provide an interpretation around what is proposed by the graph, and then I'll provide my interpretation after she's done that. So, uh, Manali, could you just sort of describe what's being uh, described in, 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 in some detail what interventions and pieces are being proposed around that, around the graph for Councillor Sinclair? Yes, uh, thank you for the question and through the chair. So, the the modeling, as mentioned, there, there are several types of, of models. And so this one is more of a phenomenological model, which is showing an example of what could happen. It's not using current Ontario data to be able to understand what's unfolding in our population. What um, So it is a tool. The one thing that we are seeing in the in these oscillations is, is um, to be able to um, maintain the health system capacity, we're seeing a drying out of curves. So we certainly need to be able to watch and put in our data that we're actually seeing in our population to see how this will be borne out, to, to be able to see more of a forecast of what we might see um, based on our new cases. Um, so, so this is just looking at, compared to the potential of what might have happened if we did nothing, what are options for us in terms of different types of public measures? Um, in terms of the social distancing and the enhanced testing. And so uh, thank you, Manali, for the, for the description. And so through the chair, uh, and Councillor Declare, you absolutely raise a good question around uh, the, the reliance on the public uh, to, uh, to continue participating in these measures. Um, and I think it's a matter of, uh, it, it, this, is, this is starting to turn towards uh, conversations that are happening at the provincial level 
conversations that are happening amongst uh, public health circles around balancing out the intervention versus the threat of the disease and how we actually, how, how we would look at things like a gradual restart of, um, of aspects of our community, of services, of businesses, uh, how we would similarly do a graded uh, curtailment or closure in the future if we did see another wave. And so then the question becomes, it's less about what happens in the summer or what happens at specific date or month, but more depending on a threshold that we see, if we're starting to see uh, an increase in deaths or an increase in ICU admissions, then we would need to take these steps. Uh, and as we're starting to see things uh, level off um, or resolve, we can then take these other steps. And then the other piece that I would I would highlight as well is uh, the, the dynamic model doesn't necessarily take into account um, the, uh, the development of a vaccine or a cure, which could also uh, help to um, alter or, or change the trajectory of our response and the nature of the interventions available to us. Uh, I have stated previously, of course, that uh, it typically takes one to one to one and a half years for a vaccine uh, to make it to market. And that's in a best case scenario where people are essentially trying to shoot a bullseye from, you know, meters and meters away right now. Um, but uh, it is possible that that may also be accelerated. And, and, and I mean, we've seen significant changes in many other uh, processes. Um, and I mean, again, any sort of decisions taken in that manner would need to weigh uh, the uh, effectiveness of the vaccine yeah. with the need to get it out quickly and all these other pieces. So there's a lot of different, um, there's a lot of different decisions that are being considered and taken. And I think this is an ongoing uh, topic of discussion, certainly at the province led by Dr. David McEwen to figure out what makes sense for what thresholds may lay ahead. Great. Thank you, both of you. Uh, wonderful, uh, report, very informative. Um, I just want to tell counsel and, and yourself, uh, the idea of running this out two years uh, is important, particularly for me. My uh, Both my grandparents uh, contracted uh, the, what was nicknamed the Spanish flu in 1920 in Windsor. My grandfather was dead and buried two days before my grandmother recovered enough to be told that he died. So this uh, oscillation and running out uh, 2018 or 1918 through to 1920, that, that's more realistic. This chart's more realistic, I think, for what we'll experience. That's it, thank you, Chair. Thank you, and I continue on with my list. It's Thompson, Raz, Groves, Mayor Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, it's uh, very good reports and it's information that we're learning going forward. So I think it's very timely. But to follow up with uh, Councillor Sinclair's uh, time frame going out, I think what we have to look at is educate the public too, that we've asked for a couple of extensions, trying to flatten out the curve. We're seeing some results. We've got a really good weekend coming up. People are gonna get start to get angsty and they want their life back. If you look at that slide uh, right there, as Councillor Sinclair was talking about, here's the issue is, this is what the new normal is gonna look like until we have a vaccine. And I was just wondering, how do we educate the public? This is what the new normal is gonna be. Uh, we've seen it with, you know, 9-11 with travel and everything else. And my question is, is how are we going to start to educate the public, especially with a weekend like coming that we're kind of coming out of a cold snap and the weather's going to be warm. People are going to get angsty. You're seeing it in the States where people are starting to rebel, want to get back to work. So I'm just, that's my first question is, how are we going to start to educate the public to, to know this is what the norm is going to be until we have a vaccine? Thanks so much uh, for the question, Mayor Thompson. And so through the chair, uh, this, is this is the essential work of public health. Uh, and uh, we recognize that there are uh, enormous challenges. Uh, human behavior tends to, um, tends to respond uh, to myriad incentives. Uh, and I, I often tell uh, many of the learners that we have through uh, the health department that simply telling people to do something 
uh, doesn't necessarily have them do it. Uh, we've seen this borne out through tobacco control. We've seen this borne out through other public health scourges like, you know, drinking while impaired, all, uh, driving while impaired, all these other things. I mean, and typically just telling people not to do something uh, has, hasn't had much success. And so I think uh, it really speaks to the whole suite of interventions that we've put in place to encourage a physical distancing, both sticks and carrots. Uh, really speaking to the idea of, you know, we have orders uh, in place, class orders for people who have COVID-19 to stay home, uh, otherwise to risk fines uh, through enforcement. Um, we have, uh, you know, uh, taken measures, and I certainly know, uh, I, I recall the city of Brampton, and I regret uh, that I don't have it foremost in my mind, but whether the other municipalities have also implemented physical distancing bylaws, um, but also just broadly the provincial order and all the other aspects of things that, that, get in, that get enforced to tell people to essentially stay home. Those are sort of the, the you know, part of the whole suite of um, interventions that we've, uh, we've put into place uh, to, to, really, uh, to really drive things. Um, and I think uh, one thing I'll mention is the constant communication is essential. So certainly the opportunity to bring these updates to council and the public. Um, we are going to be issuing a, a press release around the data dashboard that will also speak to the modeling and what we are seeing. Um, and also just making sure that people really understand uh, what is going on. Um, that, is, that is also another critical component. And I'm sure Manali can also speak to our, our ongoing work as well around the data and evidence, which is which is used to inform our messaging and inform the, the steps that uh, we would take to, to really encourage people to, to try to work together in getting through this. So Manali, did you want to add something about that? Thank you. Thank you for the question and through the chair, I think, um, the other piece that I would just add is that um, there are other countries who are ahead of us in their outbreaks and they're and they're working on this. And I, um, so we do have the ability to to learn from those countries, um, those regions, and understand what loosening of the measures and the gradual um, incline and decline of measures means to the outbreak. And so some of the modeling information and some of the data that we are are using. Um, um, that we look to the modelers to help us with those scenarios of what would happen, for example, if we went from the current measures, which um, perhaps lead to a 60% reduction in interactions, to what that would look like for a 40% or a 30% scenario and what kind of impact that would have on the outbreak while still allowing us to, to reopen. Um, and at what point might we see an exponential number of cases again? One of the pieces that um, was presented um, in the presentation, for example, around the, the mobility data, that information may also be helpful as well in terms of looking at enablers, um, enablers to, to physical distancing. So, for example, if we're seeing um, persistent visits to transportation areas, um, to be able to allow people to have the physical distancing uh, for people who need to travel, do we need to add additional buses or, or, or trains, et cetera. So these are the various pieces of information that um, that we will be, that we are looking at and that we will look at in more detail. Thank you again. Thank you, Manali. And if I, if I may, uh, just one more thing as well, Mayor Thompson, uh, it also speaks to our, our priority and our need to, to target uh, those in vulnerable settings as, as is on the slide, uh, certainly. And it speaks to the ongoing important work that we're doing in senior settings as well. Uh, to really arrest transmission in those settings, uh, but also highlight the reason why we're doing what we're doing. I mean, uh, ultimately, the whole of community needs to come together uh, to protect those people. And to the extent that we can communicate that and keep that message out there, uh, it's really about all of us uh, getting through this together. Following up with what Manali was saying, and especially like other countries similar to Germany, um, how effective is their blood testing to know that people will have the you know, have either been exposed or have it and have some kind of immunity that they can go back to work. And I think that's something that I'm saying, if it's got some validity to it, this is the way we can get um, to open things back up if you've been exposed or you've had it. Uh, because I think, as you see, there's a lot of people that are not an asthmatic, a systematic that's had this already and shown no signs does this mean that it'll come back again? But what risks is there to follow the German example if it's if it's valid, or is it valid? So uh, thank you for the question, Mayor Thompson, and through the chair, uh, we are watching what Germany is doing with serologic testing uh, with great interest. 
I do know that at the federal level, uh, Dr. Teresa Tam has stated in her um, her updates that uh, the, the federal government is actively looking at approving uh, some serologic testing. And I, I, in speaking with Dr. Jessica Hopkins, our former medical officer of health, who is now at the provincial level, I understand that they are uh, continuing to roll out a provincial testing strategy for which serology will be an important aspect of the response. So. It is a, a vitally important piece, but I would go back to what I said in my earlier answer. It's a whole of, whole, uh, basically a comprehensive approach. It's the communication, it's the enforcement, it's the incentives, it's the bylaws, and certainly it's the testing the data and the looking forward at where other countries have landed. All of that together, uh, taken together with the community as a whole, is what's going to uh, get us through this time. Thank you very much. Um, all of you have done a fantastic job, and even the long-term care response the next uh, presentation looks pretty pretty good too. So I wanna thank everybody for the fine work you've been doing under these unprecedented times. Thank you so much. Back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councillor Raz. Uh, thank you very much and thank you to uh, both of you for the presentation. Uh, we're, each time we go through these COVID updates, we're getting more and more into the details and that's certainly what we as councillors want uh, and, and I don't want you to become jaded at all with the second guessing by members of the public we know that you are trying to provide the best advice based on the best available scientific data we have at the time I know that it's getting frustrating for a lot of people because they don't have the ability to to go to work um, or they need to stay home and they're certainly spending a lot of time, more time with their kids than they had ever intended. Uh, and it's stressful, but um, you certainly from, from my perspective, we have uh, complete faith and we are behind you 110%. Um, one of my questions is regarding the, the COVID testing areas. We, we know that we're, we're testing that our frontline healthcare workers and those in long-term cares and those who have symptoms. Uh, what are we doing with the province to perhaps expand that in the region of Peel to have some of those drive-through testing um, areas where, uh, where we can get a better sense of what the levels are like in the greater population? So thank you for the question, Councillor Raz. And I, I wanted to state at the outset, uh, um, certainly not certainly not jaded and aiming to not be jaded. Uh, I have a, you know, I, I have a quote of friend. I, have, I had a very good friend. Her name was Dr. Sonali Saith, and she was uh, at Harvard Medical School, um, passed away from glioblastoma uh, a number of years ago. Um, but her, the quote that she left us with uh, was, happy is the only way to be. And so that's something that I uh, I keep in my mind, uh, regardless of whether there's a pandemic that's occurring and unfolding all around us. Um, so I, I, I did want to get that at the outset. And I know our team uh, has taken that to heart as well. In terms of testing, I do know that uh, the uh, fixed assessment centers are actually going to be uh, supplemented by a mobile assessment center, uh, which is actually being launched uh, together with Toronto Public Health and Trillium Health Partners. I just signed off uh, on, uh, on the paperwork that will allow us to have a mobile testing centre. Obviously, the priority and focus is still very much on long-term care and, uh, and senior settings at this time, and that's likely where this will be uh, deployed at the same, th at the same time. Uh, we also know uh, that uh, I believe uh, Etobicoke General Hospital has a drive-through uh, testing site that they're also uh, there as well. Um, and uh, and that, that happens to also serve uh, residents in the northwest part of the region. Um, and uh, the, the bigger piece as well, as I mentioned, is to some extent, uh, the broader population studies, those will start after um, uh, after our focus on long-term care and retirement homes, but ideally with the serology, which will allow us to figure out uh, the blood testing uh, to figure out whether people are immune or have had it, as opposed to the uh, to, to swabbing, which is more of like a, a point in time. Do you have it? Do you not have it? But you could get swabbed on a Tuesday and then pick it up on Wednesday and then the test is no longer as useful. So uh, certainly the population studies, especially something along the lines of Germany, uh, we would want to keep a close eye on what happens out there and with the ongoing approval of blood tests uh, federally and uh, and deployment provincially. Um, but at this time, it would uh, our assessment focus is uh, certainly on long-term care and retirement homes. And we are trying to move uh, both towards a, a more mobile assessment piece uh, that will support our long-term care homes. Uh, and there is at least a drive-through uh, assessment center in uh, Etobicoke General, in addition to the other five assessment centers that are put forward by uh, William Osler and uh, and William Health Partners throughout the region. Okay, thank you. For that. And my last question would be: um, 
so there's we have flu vaccines and for many of us i i get the flu vaccine every year um is this going to be part of that once there is a vaccine and part of that regular flu vaccine um uh, shot or is this something more like sars because i know we don't I don't know if SARS, once it went through the population, then got incorporated into the flu vaccine mix or it was something separate entirely. Can you distinguish between those two for me, please? Uh, thank you very much for the question, Councillor Raz, and uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, this is a really important question, and there's two answers that I'm going to provide. Um, it is a separate vaccine uh, that would hopefully be developed for COVID-19, um, and you would receive it to protect you against COVID-19. Um, that said, in the upcoming uh, flu season, we do know that flu does also cause a lot of mortality and morbidity in our community. Um, and uh, the recommendation would be for people to receive both vaccines to ensure that they would be protected against COVID-19 and also against influenza, uh, whatever the strains of the season might be uh, that time. So uh, certainly, uh, certainly, um, even if there isn't a COVID-19 vaccine, uh, by the winter time uh, or fall, I would highly we would continue to highly recommend people get their seasonal flu vaccine to prevent you know concurrent infections of influenza and COVID nineteen, um, and certainly to reduce the burden of respiratory disease because as I mentioned, this disease masquerades as flu and cold, so like it's tough to tell apart. So if we can reduce the uh, incidence of flu, it'll also reduce burden on hospital and also reduce um, challenges with control and diagnosis. Okay, thank you. And, the, and just to confirm, this is the COVID nineteen is not the flu or a flu, correct? It is a so, uh, disease. Thank you, thank you for the question, Councillor Raz, and and through through you, Mr. Chair. No, uh, COVID nineteen is caused by the virus SARS CoV two, um, which is uh, a, a coronavirus that is similar to um, the first SARS, as well as MERS, as well as the seasonal cold coronaviruses. Influenza is caused by a, a vastly different family of viruses, um, but they do present similarly in humans, which is part of the, at least part of the um, contact tracing and testing challenge that we had in the initial outset of this disease. Okay, I appreciate that. There's so much misinformation out there and we're just trying to uh, help get uh, all the information that is scientifically accurate um, out in the public. So thank you very much. And I, I have some questions on the next section, but I'll hold those to later. Thank you and Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Dr. Lowe, again, for the presentation. Um, just a quick question regarding uh, vaccines. And I and I heard what you said with regards to the timelines for developing a vaccine. In the meantime, we continue to see um, an increase in the number of um, people being infected with CO, the coronavirus. And um, so my question is, in the meantime, since we don't have a vaccine and it'll take some time, is there anything else um, that that um, can be done or is being looked at in the interim? And I and I know that they ha they really don't understand quite yet this virus. But is there anything else in the meantime? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Groves. I'll answer that question in two ways. Uh, first of all, what we can actually do, and second of all, what's being looked at. So certainly what we can do is the advice that we've been providing uh, throughout the last few weeks, which is if you're sick, you know, stay at home uh, and you know, self-isolate. Uh, and even if you're well, uh, reduce your interactions by staying at home as much as possible, uh, you know, only emerging for essential reasons, exercise uh, with yourself, a pet or a partner, um, or to do essential tasks like groceries, prescriptions, or seeking medical attention. Um, I think that advice is, is still absolutely critical at this point in time. We want to avoid large gatherings. We want to avoid uh, getting together um, and, uh, and risking the, the possibility of the virus clustering or transmitting. And certainly hand hygiene and avoiding touching one's face and all that other advice. Uh, wearing a mask if you're in a place where physical distancing is uh, is not possible. It will help to slow the spread and uh, and reduce transmission from person to person. Um, in terms of what's being looked at, certainly there's a lot of experimental uh, treatments that are being uh, studied. Uh, you know, there's a number of different antivirals that have uh, had some initial successes in clinical trials uh, as a whole. Um, but certainly, if someone does get sick. Uh, with um, COVID-19, uh, it's a matter of uh, sort of symptomatic treatment like Tylenol for fever, uh, you know, hydration, all those other pieces for the mild and moderate symptoms. 
And then in the hospitalization pieces, a lot of ICU physicians are part of a, a broader community of practice. Uh, there's a lot of new guidelines and protocols and whatnot that are being developed for patients that need uh, intensive care. Um, and so those are all steps that are being taken in the healthcare system to address more severe presentation of the disease. So uh, there's a lot of stuff being studied. Uh, there's a lot of stuff being done. But really, the easiest thing at this point in time is to stay at home as much as possible, especially if you're sick. Uh, and when you're out to make sure you're physically distancing and practicing good hand hygiene and uh, and wearing a mask to protect other people in the event that you might be uh, brewing a COVID infection. So thank you and, so much for the question. Thank you. And I understand that and I, and I get it with the physical distancing and the whole aspect of prevention. But I guess what I'm going at, uh, getting at is, is there anything that's being looked at? And uh, because obviously folks that are, that are, um, that have a compromised immune system are more at risk. And so are, are we looking at some type of immune boosting um, system or, or anything like that? Just because if you have a stronger immune system, I guess you're, it's, uh, it, you're able to fight off these viruses. So is there anything? Thank you so much for the question, Councillor Groves. Uh, I might actually pass this to Manali because I know she's been uh, uh, heavily involved in, in the details around uh, trials and data. And um, I would just say in terms of individuals who have uh, pre-existing medical conditions, one of the most important things that, that may be helpful is to either resolve or to ensure that that condition is, is under control. So certainly you want to make sure uh, you're, you know, things like high blood pressure, diabetes, that you know, medications are taken. And that's why we've said it's important for people to be able to get at their essential prescriptions to make sure those conditions are, are well controlled um, so that they don't necessarily add to complications in the event that someone does contract COVID. But Manali, did you want to speak to some of the, um, some of the specifics around the trials? Thanks, Dr. Lowe. And, um... Thank you, Councillor, um, through the chair. Uh, the only thing I would add is, is that I am aware that there is some work um, that is being done looking at antibodies from people who have recovered um, in, and being able to prepare that to make um, what, what's called immunoglobulin. Um, I, I am not completely clear that that has actually been used or whether it's still in trials, but um, we can take that back and provide that information back to you. Thank okay, you. thanks very much. Thank you both. Okay, that concludes my list. Thank you both to Manali and Lawrence. Uh, I'm assuming I have everybody um, in concert with receipt. There are no objectors. So with that, again, thank you very much for that presentation. Excellent conversation. Which brings me to 8.3. Long-term care COVID-19 response and oral presentation from Kathy Granger, Acting Commissioner of Health Services. Kathy. Hello? There you are. Okay, thank you. Go, go ahead. Thank you. Having trouble getting on. Um, so good morning, Chair, again, and members of Council. Thank you for giving me some time this morning to uh, discuss our long-term care population. Certainly, um, this is the one issue that keeps Dr. Lowe and I up at night. So uh, we appreciate you giving us a little bit of time. Um, next slide, please. So I'm going to start by talking about long-term care homes broadly across the sector. Um, so, as of today, actually, um, we have 12 of our long-term care homes across the region of Peel in COVID-19 outbreak. And you may remember that this, um, an outbreak is just defined as either one staff or one resident case of laboratory-confirmed COVID-19. It's currently considered an outbreak. Um, we've had 22 COVID-19-related deaths in our long-term care homes as of today. And as of yesterday, all this data can be find, found on our newly um, released dashboard from Public Health, which was just launched yesterday. As I mentioned previously this morning, a regional planning table has been um, set up as of uh, April 15th, and it's overseeing the development and execution of response to conduct uh, COVID-19 testing on both residents and staff at long-term care homes, retirement homes, and other congregate settings across Peel. The membership includes um, regional staff like Peel Public Health, our strategic policy and planning team, 
and Peel Regional Paramedic Services. Also includes um, hospital contacts from both Trillium and Osler and um, representatives from the Ontario Health Central Region table. This table is meeting daily and they're overseeing um, issues, as I mentioned, like testing, surveillance, infection control and, and prevention, and also virtual care and communications with families. Field Public Health, as Lawrence mentioned, has taken on the role of procuring and distributing testing kits to homes in need, supplying test teams with procedural instructions and lab requisitions, and they also conduct training for the Peel Paramedics test team. Peel Public Health is also conducting contact tracing in the homes to identify the index case and to, and to identify who to test next. And they're also providing um, steps and information to homes on outbreak management. Our paramedic services have stepped up and have prepared a contingent of staff for urgent redeployment to conduct swabbing at long-term care homes, retirement homes, shelters, and other congregate settings across the region. And they've supported this process in silver shelters and homes to date. And to date, they've swabbed over 2,000 people across our community since they've started. And Ontario Health, as I mentioned, the central region, they are monitoring testing needs across the homes and they're responsible for data reporting to the ministry and meet regularly with both the Ministry of Health and Ontario Health. And they've also done a thorough needs assessment to prioritize resources. So I will certainly reach out, I've already reached out to them uh, with your request, Mayor Brown, and we'll try and gather some more uh, further details across homes across the region. Next slide, please. As far as our regional Peel homes, as of March 19th, all our region of Peel adult day services were closed, as you, we communicated to you. These spaces are being transformed into supportive care units to cohort and isolate COVID positive residents as, as needed. Staff from our ADS have been redeployed to work in our actual homes and they are doing a fabulous job supporting our residents. And while it's difficult to physically distance in our home, as you know, because we have to provide um, care and feeding of the people living in our home, it has started to occur in some of our activation programs. We want to ensure safety while maintaining enrichment and social engagement. As you know, it's a priority for us. Physical distancing is also occurring during meal times. And this includes limiting the number of people at tables or, or two, and using two dining times when the long-term care home is an outbreak or is not an outbreak. Otherwise, uh, people are eating in their individual rooms. As you're aware, four out of five of the regional long-term care homes are currently in COVID-19 outbreak. As of, as of today, there remains no cases at Davis Centre. As of today, uh, our Tall Pines has one staff positive. Peel Manor has six residents positive and seven staff who have been positive. They have th seen three residents pass away. And we are have implemented the supportive care unit at Peel Manor. At, uh, shared, shared and Villa has four residents who are positive and three staff who are positive. As of today, um, Malton Village has one resident positive and, one, and two staff people who are positive. The loss of a loved one is never easy and it is definitely tragic during this time and our sincere condolences go out to the individuals and staff at both Peel Manor and Sheridan Villa. These residents are our families. During this difficult time and the uncertainty around the pandemic, staff absenteeism has increased with our long-term, particularly when our long-term care homes go into outbreak. So certainly staff sustainability planning is being developed to support staffing needs. As of April 16th, there have been a 26% loss of staff overall. And this is due to sick time, isolation needs, and staff choosing to work at only one location. Some of them who had worked in the hospital and one of our homes, they've just chosen to work in, um, at the hospital at this time. 
And additionally, um, during in order to manage our outbreak requirements, we require extra staff to manage um, the intensive screening that we're doing, PPE, inventory management, and certainly when we move into isolation and cohorting our residents, extra staff is required for that as well. Uh, we have been doing um, active recruitment and to date have hired about 22 new staff and continue to do some outreach to uh, bring on more staff. So we've been clo working closely with our regional recruitment partners. Some of the next steps are that we're trying to continue to find and tap into sources for more RNs and PSW candidates because that is certainly a priority for us. We have also been, also been working with our regional appeal staff broadly and um, have redeployed a number of them to support active screening and uh, PPE oversight and scheduling of staff. Next slide, please. As of March 9th, when homes submit specimens for standard respiratory testing, these specimens are also tested for COVID-19 automatically. There was no change to usual practices for submitting respiratory outbreak specimens. On March 19th, active screening of all visitors, resident admissions, readmissions, and returning residents was implemented. As of March 13th, um, Chief Medical Officer of Health also strongly recommended that long-term care only allow essential visitors in the homes until further noticed. And we continue to only allow essential visitors to resident to um, see their residents who are very ill or at the end of life care. And this is really in the rare situation. We are really um, promoting virtual visits, which I'll talk about a little bit later in my presentation. And on March 19th, it was recommended that healthcare workers who have traveled outside of Canada within the last 15, 14 days of so, who have traveled outside of Canada, self-isolate for 14 days, starting from their arrival into Ontario. Next slide, please. Just to go over some of our newer provincial regulations, because there have been a number of them each day. Um, several regulatory amendments to the Long-Term Care Act came to effect on March 20th and 24th. And these include things like um, whether an RN um, needs to be on home on a regular basis, it's changed and um, made that requirement a little bit more looser. It has loosened up on some of our documentation requiring, requirements. It's allowed for more flexibility in the timing of police record checks for staff. And it's prioritized the timing of specific tra training requirements so that we can bring on more staff more quickly. A new emergency order for long-term ca term care staff by limiting work to one location retirement home or other health service provider also came into effect on April 22nd. And we had already started this um, since April 3rd, which also does impact our staffing. Next slide, please. In terms of funding, on March 17th, 25 million was directed to long-term care homes for immediate relief to fund the extraordinary costs related to the rapid response. This investment was to support increased operational costs related to screening, staffing, supplies, and equipment to help maintain the health and safety of our homes, residents, and staff. At that time, each of our homes received $37,500. In lieu of a 2020 Ontario budget, the province also released an action plan for responding to COVID-19. This update included a $243 million investment in surge capacity for long-term care sector. Of this money, $114 million is being used for prevention and containment, including $25 million in April to provide each home, $37,500. Eligible expenses for this funding include staffing expenses for screening and providing care, increased costs for cleaning equipment and operating, and for any other expense based on clinical evidence. They also announced $89 billion in continued prevention and containment, and this amount is yet to be distributed. 
The remaining 129 million for the long-term care sector is to be used in building capacity and easing pressure in hospitals. We have yet to hear how this funding will be utilized since hospital staff will be deployed to long-term care to ease pressure at home. Next slide, please. <clears throat> As you know, it's extremely important for our homes and all the homes across the sector to remain connected with both the staff in our homes and also the residents. So some of the ways that we've been trying to do this during this unprecedented times, for the people working in our center, we've utilized bi-weekly staff memos. We have ongoing unit huddles. We're emailing everybody uh, frequently. We have mass call-outs that we use with our staff. We have also implemented COVID-19 information boards and have weekly virtual town halls. And our families, as you know, are a priority, particularly in this difficult time where they have limited access to the people, their loved ones in our home. We have ongoing phone calls. We email updates out to them regularly. We are also using a mass call-out tool so that we, they can reach them. We've implemented a number of initiatives, such as I Love You report cards that get sent to them. We are using a lot of uh, technology to support virtual visits and have virtual town halls with our families, which have been extremely successful and well-received. They do remain our priority. Next slide, please. And then lastly, I just wanted to highlight how we're caring for the heroes in our staff, of our staff who are coming to work every day to support the people in our homes. They're working in our homes on the front line for the fight. And while these staff are working tirelessly to keep everyone safe, we are really working hard to support these heroes. All our staff are provided with masks and when necessary, full PPE. Staff have received training and resources on proper use. And PPE task forces are also being created in each of the homes to continue to support effective management of use of PPE. To support their tireless efforts, as of March 30th, 30th, staff are provided with meal provisions during their shift, including the staff on night shifts. The region is also partnering with licensed child care providers, as we've mentioned to council, to deliver free emergency child care for eligible healthcare and frontline workers during this pandemic. And I know it has been utilized by some of our long-term care staff. As of Saturday, April 18th, accommodations have also begun um, to be arranged for long-term care staff who have tested positive for COVID-19 or are working with confirmed COVID-19 residents or have been told by public health to self-isolate. This helps to protect them and their families. Other supports on site, such as food and laundry and transportation, are being investigated to support long-term care staff who are re relocating from their homes. In our long-term care homes, leadership and presence and support is available, including weekends, evenings, with further support on standby with needed, as needed. We are working to support and care for our brave frontline staff for caring for our vulnerable seniors in long-term care. For our part-time staff, we have also um, increased uh, the availability of full-time hours, and that's been offered to them for two, at least two weeks now, and they've certainly taken advantage of that. Next slide, please. And that's the end of my formal um, presentation, but I'm quite happy to uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Next up is Councillor Downey. And Councillor Downey, I know you're down for item 8.8 .8 as well, the notice of motion relating to advocacy for long-term care funding. If you'd like to speak to that at this time as well. I would thank you through you, Chair, uh, to uh, Commissioner Granger and her entire team. I, I really just want to thank you for all the work that you've done. It's clear through your presentation that we, um, as a region, are are doing our best to um, take care of our long-term care staff and uh, residents um, and the families that, uh, you know, obviously are showing uh, a number of concerns, as Mayor Brown mentioned, 
I think that um, anything that we can do to advocate uh, to the province for uh, additional supports for our staff in, in the uh, long-term care facilities is a benefit. Um, you know, it was interesting for me to see uh, the Premier put forward uh, armed forces to help uh, within our long-term care facilities across the province. Um, I not I wasn't shocked, but I thought it was it was a strong move, and it really goes to show us that um, in the instances of close proximity uh, in our healthcare sector um, is really where our numbers are are um, rising. So I think anything that we can do to promote continued support of the staff at that level is a benefit. Um, the motion speaks for itself, but uh, happy to bring it forward now. I know Councillor Raz has agreed to second, um, and uh, if you'd like, I can read it out. Thank you. Um, I, am I going to deal with the resolution at this time, or perhaps we'll deal with it when we come back and I'll get a seconder at the appropriate time. Next up, my list is Groves, Kovac, Raz, and Crombie. Councillor Groves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Kathy, thank you for the presentation. And I just want to really give a big thank you to the, um, the staff in the long-term care homes really right across this province and right across the country. I know my mom is in a long-term care home and thank God they're safe over there and there's been no issues with outbreaks or, or anything. Um, so I certainly know how hard the staff uh, work in, uh, under normal circumstances. So under these types of circumstances that we're facing right now, they're, they're working even harder. So I really wanna thank them for all of the work that they do and for caring for, for our loved ones. It's very difficult on families, and I know that firsthand, not being able to um, to visit um, um, our loved ones in the homes, and, and it's, it's, it's even more difficult on those folks who are in the homes as well, that they can't see their family either. So anyway, but I know that staff are doing everything that they can to make sure that they're at ease and that they're as comfortable as possible and as safe. Um, the, um, the question, and Kathy, thank you for, for letting me, letting us know that the Davis Center is safe because I do have um, a lot of questions from folks in our community about our long-term care home at the Davis Center, so glad to hear that. And I also want to say a big thank you to those staff at the Davis Center. And again, under normal circumstances, they're wonderful. And I know under these circumstances, they're doing a great job um, in making families feel comfortable, families and reassuring families that uh, their loved ones are, are safe and, and, and are well cared for. So thank you for that. Um, the question, I have a couple of questions, um, and I know we're focused on long-term care, but we also have uh, um, other seniors' buildings in our community that um, have independent living. And, and I understand you have your PPEs in the long-term care, but I had a call yesterday from one of my residents in one of my buildings. She's 90 years old, and she was concerned that um, a number of people are walking around in the building and they have no mask, they have nothing. Um, and I know a couple days ago, staff did go out and, um, and installed hand sanitizers in the lobby. But um, what are we doing for those folks? And I don't know if this falls under you or who it falls under, but I mean, these are, we have a lot of seniors in those buildings and um, with um, other health conditions. And if they're going around in there um, without masks or they're knocking on each other's doors, I, it's a concern for me. So I, I don't know who wants to address this or. Uh, um, yeah, I'm happy to, uh, through you, Mr. Chair, thank you for the question and for your comments. Um, yeah, certainly um, you can send that to me. Um, I'll, I'll take that back, Councillor Groves, and we can certainly um, go through our community response table. We do get a lot of emails for requests for PPE and support for our buildings. So I uh, certainly can speak to you offline and bring that request forward. Because, um, yeah, and we're happy to support where we can. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm, I'm going to, to my three buildings in my community this afternoon. I'm gonna go drop them off some gloves and hand sanitizers, but I will certainly send the request through because I know that um, it, it'll be an ongoing issue in those buildings. Um, and again, Kathy, thank you. And please pass on my thanks to all of our um, 
healthcare workers in our long-term care facilities. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gross. Thank you. And I see Commissioner Sheehy's jumped on the list. Commissioner, did you wish to speak to this matter as well? Yes, thank you, and through the chair. Uh, Councillor Groves, I'm not sure if you're referring to some of our community housing providers or our Peel Housing Corporation buildings. We have shared our protocols with all of our community housing providers, and in our Peel Housing Corporation seniors buildings, we do have additional protocols in place. They do have access to protective equipment. We have moved to a model where only emergency repairs are done and there is screening of seniors before our superintendents actually enter their units. So there are a number of policies and procedures that are in place that we have implemented working with Peel Public Health. Thank you, Janice. And sorry, did you say they have access to the uh, PPEs? Yes, we do in our Peel Housing Corporation buildings. Okay, so these residents are not aware and neither am I. So maybe um, you can just um, send me an email, um, Janice, on how we, so I can pass this message on to them and where they can access it and that. And I mean, in the meantime, I'm gonna drop some off to them. But oh, I, I'm sorry, Councillor Gross, when I talk about PPE, it's for staff. Sorry? When I talk about personal protective equipment, I'm referring um, to staff, not residents or tenants of the buildings. Okay, okay. Well, I was talking, okay, about the tenants. So, um, okay, well, in any case, I'm going to go deliver some to them anyway, so at least they have it. But um, I guess the re then, Kathy, there's no point in me sending you a request because the PPEs is only really for staff. Is that correct? Um, yes, well, that, that's certainly our priority right now. So I apologize if I misunderstood. Yes. For, for the residents, we really continue to recommend um, the physical distancing and social distancing. All right, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and next up is Councillor Raz, who I believe will also be seconding for me Councillor Downey's resolution. Councillor Raz. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation uh, today, Kathy. Um, a few questions. Uh, I, I'm just wondering, a lot of long-term care homes over the over the province or across the province are now going to be in a position of having to hire more qualified uh, staff to assist. And I know that the premier, in some cases, in those urgent cases, has called in the army. But what are we doing to? Uh, and you mentioned the police checks to expedite that process, but actually being able to get qualified staff in there. Mm -hmm. Um, through you, Chair, uh, thank you, Councillor Raz, for the question. Uh, and I'll start it, and there may be, um, I, th I think Mary Clavier, Director of HR, is also on the line that she may be able to build on what I say, but certainly there's um, provincial um, recruitment portals that we've been trying to use. I know that RNAO has brought forward um, a number of retired staff, so we've been able to build on some of those efforts to be able to bring staff into our homes. Um, and as I mentioned, some of the new regulations and changes from the province house have allowed us to expedite some of the hiring requirements. So we've been trying to, um, you know, bring on staff as quickly as possible. I know some of our um, previous volunteers that we've had in the homes have also been applying to work, um, which has been um, which has been really helpful as well. Um, so we're trying to look at all different avenues because as you're, you're aware, it is, it is certainly a challenge that we're all facing across, across the province. Um, so certainly the hospital staff um, are helpful when they're coming in, um, not only to review infection prevention and support homes with that, but also to help with some of the staffing. So I know that this is being looked at at the, um, the central response table in terms of the homes that have the biggest need for staffing and they are trying to bring in um, both community um, like case coordinators who used to do um, community work. They're not as busy anymore, so they're trying to bring in some staff from that avenue as well. So I know that there's many different prongs in, the, in being looked at across each region to be able to uh, prioritize where the staffing needs are. Okay, thank There's you for that. Uh, I was yeah. happy to see that we've kind of expanded our um, outreach to families. I think it's both very stressful from the, the resident perspective and also those of the families who were unable to visit. Uh, so the virtual visits and town halls and um, the, the, the phone calls, I think, 
will help every uh, will help everybody. Uh, when it comes to our long term supply of PPE for our staff in long term care homes, are we managing that, or is that being coordinated through um, uh, through the province or Trillium Health Partners? Um, so a little bit of both. Certainly for our regional homes, we do have it is being managed uh, regionally. Um, but we do all long term care homes are required uh, every day to send forward their inventory to the province. So there is a provincial oversight as well. We also have to demonstrate that we're being frugal with our supply and how we're um, ensuring that we're not overusing PPE. So there are so daily uh, we do have to send in reports. And um, if there is an urgent need, we do go through our central region um, and, and ask for extra PPE as needed. And do we know how that long-term supply is looking at this point? Um, well, I think um, so far we haven't run into any issues. I think it continues. I know as of this week, we're all, every long-term care home in the province is getting an extra shipment of masks. So we continue to hear, see and hear positive signs that it is finally being refurbished on a more consistent basis. Okay, thank you. And last question, uh, the meals during shifts, uh, are, are we, um, if there's restaurants who want to reach out and assist, is that something uh, that we can, uh, we can help coordinate between our local restaurants and our local long-term care homes? Yeah, certainly. Um, Send me that information and I'm happy to. We've been using one consistent vendor because as you can imagine, it's quite a number of um, meals to coordinate, but certainly send me that information and I will send it to our food coordinators and uh, they're happy to look at that. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Oh, oh, sorry, Mr. Chair, I, I would uh, just confirm that uh, I spoke about this with Councillor Downey yesterday and I'm, I'm uh, very happy to second her motion and thank you for putting the uh, the, the work into that. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Crombie. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Kathy, for the presentation. Just three things. First, uh, we're all reiterating that data for the private LTCs as well as our fuel facilities is very important and in a timely way to share with us. We can add it to the dashboard and we'll check regularly, but we do, we all require that information. Secondly, and this is for everyone, Mississauga shared a letter that we've written to the minister um, similar to Councillor Downey and Councillor Grass's motion. And just to conclude, I'll just read the concluding paragraph because you may not have seen it came out early this morning. On behalf of our council and the people of Mississauga, we call upon you, Minister, and your government to permanently change the rules governing workers in our LTC homes by mandating that staff only work in one home and not transfer between homes. To make this a reality, we call on the province to mandate that all PSWs and care workers in LTC homes be provided with a living wage and where possible, benefits commensurate with the tough job that they do. This will, will require full hours and wholesale change to how LT LTC homes conduct business, but I think most Ontarians would agree that these changes that are in need must be made now. Thank you for your consideration. So that's going out for Mississauga, and it's in keeping with the sentiment of your motion, Councillor Downey, so we thank you. And to Kathy, thirdly and finally, um, I talk about my mom, Veronica, often. She's 84 and in lockdown, just like Hazel. But she does have a PSW coming to, to see her. So what about those PSW? Here we are asking that PSWs only work in one facility, one residence, not uh, divide their time between multiple, but yet the PSWs are out in the community as well, visiting, visiting seniors in our communities. Uh, what protection measures can be taken for those seniors, Kathy? Oh, thank you, Mayor Crombie, for the question. This has been raised a number of times. I know at, at the province with um, Minister Elliott as well. So I know that they are investigating this, and it has been a discussion also at our central table to be able to use more consistent staffing. Um, certainly ensuring they have the PPE that they need to go in as well to care for their loved ones. but. Um, I will, I will double check to see if we, I have any update on that and certainly get back to you if they've made any progress in terms, of, in terms of the community. Thank you, Kathy. I'm particularly interested to know if those workers out in the field, out in our communities are being tested as well before they go and visit those vulnerable seniors that are in their homes. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the clarification. I'll, I'll certainly um, speak, 
speak to Dr. Lowe and look into that. Thank you. Thank you, that concludes my list. Madam Clerk, over to you to deal with items 8.3 and 8.8. Thank you, the motion by Councillor, moved by Councillor Downey, seconded by Councillor Raz. Whereas health care workers in the region of Peel, long-term care homes are essential workers serving the most vulnerable population while, while facing added risk and exposure, working on the front line during the COVID-19 crisis. And whereas COVID-19 outbreak has been declared in four region of Peel long-term care homes with 10 residents and 11 staff testing positive and one resident death as of April 19th. And whereas there has been challenges to ensure required staffing at region of Peel long-term care homes. And whereas in order to manage outbreak requirements, a minimum of 20 additional staff is needed 24 hours a day in each of the homes in outbreak. And whereas the region of Peel has reasonably taken measures to support the health and safety of staff through supportive measures, such as screening all staff twice a day, ensuring personal protective equipment is available, and isolating and cohorting resident cases of COVID-19. And whereas the province has implemented a COVID-19 action plan to protect long-term care homes by providing greater measures to testing, screening, surveillance, outbreak management, and growing the long-term care workforce. And whereas other provinces and worker unions have begun negotiating premiums to support frontline health workers. Therefore, be it resolved that the regional chair on behalf of regional council advocate to the premier, the minister of health, and the minister of long-term care to request that the province implement and fund a program to provide premium pay to long-term care workers for the duration of Ontario's COVID-19 state of emergency. And Madam Clerk, before you take the vote, I see uh, CAO Nancy Polzinelli's jumped up on my list. Nancy, was it with regards to this before we conduct the vote? Thank you, Chair Yanika. It is with regards to the topic, not to that motion. So if you'd like to carry on with the motion, I can wait. Very good, back to you, Clerk. I'll call the vote then, Mayor Brown. Yes, yes. Mayor Brown in favor, Councillor Carlson. Councillor yes. Councillor Carlson in favor, Mayor Crombie. Yes. Mayor Crombie in favor, Councillor Demerla is absent. Councillor Dasko. Yes. yes. Councillor Dasko in favor, Councillor Dillon. Yes. Councillor Dillon in favor, Councillor Downey. Yes. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca. Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini. Yes. Councillor Fortini in favor. Councillor Groves. Yes. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes. Yes. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac. Yes. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney. Yes. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden. Yes. Councillor McFadden in favour. Councillor Medeiros. Councillor Medeiros. Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favour. Councillor Pileshi. Yes. Councillor Pileshi in favour. Yes. Councillor Parrish. Yes. Councillor Parrish in favour. Councillor Raz. Yes. Councillor Raz in favour. Councillor Sato. Yes. Councillor Sato in favour. Councillor Santos. Yes. Yes. Councillor Santos in favour. Councillor Sinclair. Yes. Councillor Sinclair in favour. Councillor Starr. Yes. Councillor Starr in favour. Mayor Thompson. Yes, in favour. Mayor Thompson in favour. Councillor Vicente. Yes. Councillor Vicente in favour. Passes unanimously. So that sorry, carries. Uh, Kath, sorry, uh, this is Councillor Maderos. I'd like to say yes as well. Yes, we under record. understood you as such. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And so with that, we've dealt with 8.8 eight and the receipt of 8.3. Back to you, Nancy. Thank you. Through the chair, I just wanted to reiterate to council that why we, while we don't have a clear line of sight to into 
those long-term care homes within the region of Peel. We do understand and appreciate the need for more information, so I know Kathy and team will take that back and, and get some information. In the meantime, I just want to reiterate uh, part of a conversation that happened at the mayor's meeting tomorrow. Families are reaching out, and we appreciate the reaching out to our council members. If at any time you'd like to send those families or direct them to regional clerk, then we will certainly at least have the conversation we will have those conversations with the families. Many times we do have long-term care homes that are overwhelmed and families that just need some information. So whether that be through our members, our staff, or with our colleagues at the province or the LINS, we'll make sure that um, families get at least some reassurance. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Parrish, on this subject. I'm waiting to speak on 8.7. I always write it out clearly. I don't know why it's being shoved through at the wrong time. I'll come back to you then. Uh, so with that, all of that has been dealt with, 8.8 eight and 8.3. That brings me to 8.4 has been dealt with at the beginning of the meeting. Brings me to 8.5, COVID-19 funding for the most vulnerable, responding to the immediate needs of the community. I believe we have a brief presentation from Commissioner Sheehy. Yes, we do, and through the chair. Thank you for the opportunity to address this report. I'd like to begin by providing some context to the way in which we are processing applications and then give a few examples to illustrate how the emergency fund is supporting the community. Then I'll move on to housing and homelessness initiatives and talk about next steps. As of yesterday, April 22nd, the fund has received 66 applications totaling just under $3.6 million. To date, 50 applications have been granted, totaling $1,055,000, let me start that again, sorry, $1,055,863. To ensure that we are only funding the most urgent of needs related to COVID-19, thereby staying within the eligibility criteria of the fund and ensuring accountability for the use of the funds, the review of each application is done through a tiered approach with additional levels of approval required by management based on the materiality of the dollar amount requested. Now, I'd like to briefly highlight three applications. Funding for just over $10,000 was provided to Active Adult Center of Mississauga to support up to 200 at-risk seniors with eight weeks of care kits, both the creation and delivery of these kits. Funding of $11,000 was provided to Caledon Meals on Wheels to support increased demand for meal boxes and for cleaning supplies and operating expenses for their new grocery delivery model. And my last example, Hope 24-7 in Brampton, who also received $11,000 of funding, which was for women and youth experiencing domestic violence, which we know is a heightened risk at this time. The funding was used to purchase meal and gift cards for clients and to move to online counseling. I specifically chose this example as it illustrates how, as the more immediate needs are resolved, we plan to evolve the focus of the fund towards supporting agencies to change the way they deliver services during COVID-19. We will be bringing a report to Council on the next agenda to provide further information of how the process is working and details by each community agency for all of the applications that have been approved. Now, with respect to housing and homelessness related initiatives, as highlighted in the report, it is difficult to forecast the costs as they are dependent on a number of factors, such as, but not limited to, duration of the pandemic, and the number of people affected. Costs projected out to September 1st are currently estimated at approximately $6 million. Because of the financial uncertainties, we will update Council each month through the Chief Financial Officer's reports on the financial impact of COVID-19 and through the regular triannual reporting process. The report you have today highlights the immediate needs and associated costs where available. As we move into the medium and longer term planning horizon, and let me emphasize that this analysis is already underway, our focus is on 
how we assist the not-for-profit sector to adapt their service delivery models to provide programs in this new environment, and post-COVID-19 on helping them increase their capacity to deal with what we expect will be an enhanced demand for services. In addition, we will determine what measures are needed to be implemented to support our community housing providers as they deal with revenue losses, costs of which we have conservatively estimated at this point to be approximately $10 million. We will be bringing a report to Council this spring to provide more details of our recommended medium and longer term approach and the estimated costs associated with this approach. In total, the preliminary costs of supporting the community from immediate needs all the way through to post-COVID-19 are estimated to be above $20 million. So while the federal and provincial funding is certainly welcome, it is insufficient to meet community needs. I am happy to take your questions. Do I have any questions at this time? If not, you have a motion, Madam Clerk, over to you. I'll need a mover and a seconder for the motion. It was contained in the materials. I'll read it. That the I'm happy to move it, Councillor Downey. I'll second the second. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Downey, seconded by Councillor Vicente that the Commissioner of Human Services be authorized to execute the Reaching Home COVID-19 Response Plan Transfer Payment Agreement, Canada's Economic COVID-19 Response Plan, support for people experiencing and at risk of homelessness for receipt of the additional COVID-19 Reaching Home funding on business terms satisfactory to the Commissioner of Human Services and on legal terms satisfactory to the Regional Solicitor. And further, that the Commissioner of Human Services be delegated authority to approve the use of the funding for service provision in accordance with the federal special COVID-19 directives and in response to local needs. And further, that the director responsible for the service provision funding be delegated authority to execute agreements and other related documents to deliver COVID-19 reaching home programming and financial supports on business terms satisfactory to the Commissioner of Human Services and on legal terms satisfactory to the regional solicitor. And further, that the Commissioner of Human Services be authorized to execute the Social Services Relief Fund Community Homelessness Prevention Initiative Agreement for receipt of the COVID-19 emergency funding from the province of Ontario on business terms satisfactory to the Commissioner of Human Services and on legal terms satisfactory to the regional solicitor. And further, that the Commissioner of Human Services be delegated authority to approve the use of the funding for service provisions in accordance with the special COVID-19 program details and in response to local needs. And further, that the director responsible for the service provision funding be delegated authority to execute agreements and other related documents to deliver the COVID-19 social services relief fund programming and financial supports on business terms satisfactory to the Commissioner of Human Services and on legal terms satisfactory to the regional solicitor. And further, that the 2020 housing support gross expenditures and revenues be increased by $11,835,021 as a result of additional federal and provincial funding. I'll call the vote. I see you may have a list though. Councillor Santos, was it on this matter? It, it was, yes. And, and just uh, for clarification on, on the motion itself, uh, through you, Chair, and to um, the Commissioner. Um, there's a lot there in the motion. There's um, mention of local needs and addressing local needs, and I absolutely support the motion. I just wanted to make um, it clear that you will be still, even though you have delegated authority, I'm making an assumption that you will still be consulting with the local municipalities um, for advice and um, any red flags that we may have with the disbursement of the funds. So absolutely, and to emphasize what you said at the beginning of the meeting, Councillor Santos, the process is working very well. We have local representation on the community response table, and we're finding that together um, we are working and doing a much more um, insightful job of determining what the needs are in the community and how to address them. So yes, the answer is yes. Thank you so much. Seeing no other speakers, call the vote. Mayor Brown? Yes. Mayor Brown in favor, Councillor Carlson? 
Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie. Mayor Crom. <laughs> Mayor Crombie. Councillor Demurla is absent. Councillor Dasko? Yes. Councillor Dasko in favor. Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor yes. Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey? In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca? Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini? Yes. Councillor Fortini in favor. Councillor Groves? Yes. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes? Yes. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac? Yes. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney? Yes. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden? Yes. Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileschi? Yes. Councillor Pileschi in favor. Councillor Parrish? Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz? Yes. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair? Yes. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr? Yes. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson? Yes, uh, yes in favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente? Yes. Councillor Vicente in favor. <coughs> I'll loop back to Mayor Crombie. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, and through to my colleagues, I know we're past the 1230 hour, but I think we've done most of the heavy lifting, so I think I carry on with your blessing. And with that, we come to item 8.6, uh, amendment to the Sorry, waste management. If, if I could to the chair. Yes. Uh, I just see uh, Mayor Crombie, so I believe she's knocked out of the meeting. She's okay. in support, but she says she can't see or hear anything. Okay, thank you very much. I, I, I nod over to our technical people to see what it is that they can do, and we acknowledge um, how she would have voted on that matter. Thank you very much. Um, with that, on to item 8.6, Amendment to the Waste Management System Fees and Charges Bylaw 17-2007, as amended in the Waste Collection Bylaw 35-2015 during a declared emergency. I believe Commissioner Farr wanted to make a comment, but uh, uh, shout out to Councillor Fortini. You had a question, as I recall, related to waste in this. Perhaps I can cue you up to get ready to ask your question at the appropriate time as well once Andrew's given us his update. Andrew. Uh, thank you, uh, Terry Nika, and through you. Can, can everyone hear me? Yes, go ahead. Perfect, thank you. Uh, good morning, and first, thank you for your support over the last few weeks as we've implemented the changes uh, to waste management stemming from our last council meeting. Uh, today's report serves to update the two waste bylaws to ensure we can work together to continue to make efficient decisions related to waste management. Delegated authority is being requested to more easily respond to COVID-19 without having to go through the process of formal by bylaw amendment for each change. And of course, council will be made aware, made aware when delegated authority is being considered in advance. Uh, delegated authority will allow uh, the commissioner to uh, waive fees at the CRCs like we have done and to adjust waste management services and waive the corresponding bylaw provisions. Uh, examples of service changes that require bylaw updates uh, could be what we are dealing with today, uh, the changes uh, or suspension of fees or services. Uh, we're also proposing to suspend the need to give residents advance notice of changes to the fees and charges bylaw. Uh, of course, residents will be made, of well, uh, be made aware of decisions related to fees, charges and services as they're made. However, the bylaws as written now require 10 days notice. So we wanna make sure we can work well with council to make uh, changes quickly uh, if we identify the need. Um, I'd also like to provide a very brief update on the uh, council direction we received at the last meeting so that you know what work we have done to date. Um, related to textile bins and dumping, uh, we're working with the local municipalities, charities and property owners on the cleanup of any uh, clothing and textile bins that we know of. Uh, where requested, the region is collecting material left at the bins and as we mentioned at the previous meeting, unfortunately disposing of it as garbage. 
Uh, Diabetes Canada has arranged for cleanup of their bins, which took place on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. And these bins will be monitored uh, going forward and cleaned up as needed. We've also developed a release form which would allow the region to access private property to clean up any textile bins in plazas, malls, et cetera. And that is currently being reviewed by the local municipalities and we hope to move forward soon. Uh, we are prepared to mobilize uh, anywhere uh, that, that we may be called upon um, by private um, uh, property owners. And lastly, the Diabetes Canada textile bins that we've used in our pilot uh, will be emptied uh, by next week and relocated to 7100 to here Ontario into the parking lot where we will shrink rack them and gate them and then put them back in place uh, when the time comes. We also continue to work with the local municipalities on illegal dumping. Um, we're increasing the no dumping signs as well as working together on uh, cleanup of local and roads. Lastly, related to garbage collection, as you know, the two extra bag uh, exemption period started this week. Uh, early observations on the 20th and 21st is that uh, 2% of households have been setting out extra bags and about 0.5% of those households are uh, setting out more than two extra bags. We will uh, work with those households that are uh, setting out more than the two bag limit, uh, provide them with um, stickers on those extra bags to let them know that the rule is two. And we're hoping that that will um, reduce over the next couple of weeks as we work with them. So that is the end uh, of my update and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I first go to Councillor Fortini to see if he had a related inquiry. Now would be the time, Pat. Uh, sorry, Chair Unica, this is Councillor Maderos. Councillor Fortini had a step away uh, for a uh, personal matter. Um, so I, I'll just raise this question if that's okay, Chair. Absolutely. Please proceed. Thank you. Uh, and the question is around the two bag, I guess, uh, the additional bags that we added in terms of service. So he's been getting uh, messages uh, uh, from his residents that they left out their two bags and they did not receive, uh, they weren't picked up. They were told by, I guess, the um, the folks uh, doing the collection that uh, another truck would come by. Um, I've experienced this in my area as well, but uh, again, I'm not sure, uh, I'm not 100% um, sure as these calls haven't gone directly to me. Uh, so it's just uh, if, uh, if the commissioner can uh, just uh, comment on uh, when we expect the service to, I guess, be fine-tuned or be rolled out. Uh, thanks for your question, Councillor. That is, um, I was not aware of that those situations were occurring. Um, it should be, we should be collecting those bags now. I didn't have any uh, feedback on that. Uh, if you have any examples of areas where we have missed or not uh, done it properly, I'd be happy to follow up and make sure that uh, in the follow-up weeks that, that doesn't happen. Sure, I'll, I'll get Councillor Fortini's office to follow up with you. Thank That'd you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Seeing no other speakers on my list, I turn it over to the clerk to conduct the vote. So there is a motion. Can I have a mover and a seconder, please, for the motion that was in the materials that were provided? Alan, I'll move it. Thank you, Mayor Thompson. Rod, Rod Starr. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Starr. Moved by Mayor Thompson, seconded by Councillor Starr, that the amendments to the Waste Management System Fees and Charges Bylaw 17-2007, as amended, and the Waste Collection Bylaw 35-2015, described in the report from the Commissioner of Public Works titled Amendments to the Waste Management System Fees and Charges Bylaw 17-2007 as amended and the Waste Collection Bylaw 35-2015 during a declared emergency be approved. And further, that the Commissioner of Public Works be granted delegated authority during a declared emergency and for so long following the termination of a declared emergency as may be necessary for the purpose to waive any waste management system fees and charges otherwise payable for dropping off waste at the region's community recycling centers to the extent deemed by the commissioner to be appropriate as a measure taken to effectively respond to the declared emergency. And further, that the Commissioner of Public Works be granted delegated authority during a declared emergency to adjust waste management services and to waive any requirement respecting the provision of waste management services as the Commissioner may deem appropriate as a measure to effectively respond to the declared emergency. And further, that the necessary amending bylaws be presented for enactment. 
And further, that suspension by the regional chair for the duration of the COVID-19 declared emergency of the requirement to provide public notice at least 10 days before the enactment of a bylaw amending fees and charges as permitted in the region's corporate public notice policy G00-16 be endorsed. I'll call the vote. Mayor Brown. Yes. Mayor Brown in favor. Councillor Carlson. Councillor Carlson. Uh, yes. Councillor Car Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie. Yes. Mayor and Crombie. yes to the previous one I got thrown out of the thrown out yep. of the system. Mayor Crombie, yeah, in favor. Councillor Demurla is absent. Councillor Dasko. Yes. Councillor Dasko in favor. Councillor Dillon. Yes. Councillor Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey. In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca. Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini. Councillor Groves. Yes. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes. Yes. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac. Yes, I'm in favor. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney. Yes. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden. Yes. Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros. Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi. Yes. Councillor Pileshi in favor. Councillor Parrish. Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz. Yes. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato. Yes. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos. Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. <coughs> Councillor Sinclair. Yes. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr. Yes. Councillor Starr in fair, favor. Mayor Thompson. Yes, in favor. Mayor, Fa Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente. Yes. Councillor Vicente in favor. Carries. Thank you. Thank you. That brings me down to the last item on our COVID-19 agenda. That would be item 8.7, federal funding support for municipalities. I believe Councillor Parrish had a thought on this. Councillor Parrish. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, the first two parts of the recommendation are fine. Uh, the third part, uh, the Chief Financial Officer and City Manager for Mississauga have requested we defer part three, which is the task force. They believe the striking of a task force is a bit premature. We don't know if the gas tax will be used as relief to municipalities or if a completely different model will be used. We may not get anything at all. The region transfers 83% of the gas tax to the lower tiers. For Mississauga, that's $17 million a year and has to be protected so our transit program remains funded. Brampton probably has the same concern because Mayor Brown has agreed to second my deferral of part three. Once the Fed or provincial governments make an announcement, we can revisit this proposed task force concept with a better knowledge of what we're up against. So I would move deferral, and uh, Chair Brown has agreed to second that part, only the third section, and further that a task force consisting of. Okay, so just to be clear, that is, you are the movers and the seconder, so you're just amending your own motion that that third clause be held off at this time. That is the motion before me now. Does anybody else wish to speak to that? Seeing no one on my list, I turn it to the clerk to conduct the vote on the amended motion. Moved by Councillor Parrish and seconded by Mayor Brown that the federal government be encouraged to move quickly with additional direct funding support to municipalities to address the COVID-19 pandemic fiscal pressures and to stimulate economic recovery. And further, that a letter be sent from the regional chair on behalf of regional council to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, the Association of Municipalities of Ontario, and to all members of parliament for support in expediting federal funding. And I'm going to call the vote. Mayor Brown. Yes. Mayor Brown in favor. Councillor Carlson. Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor. Mayor Crombie. Yes. Mayor Crombie in favor. Councillor Demurla. Oh, she's absent. Councillor Dasko. Yes. Councillor Dasko in favor. Councillor Dillon. 
Yes. Councillor Dillon in favor. Councillor Downey. Councillor Downey. In favor. Councillor Downey in favor. Councillor Fonseca. Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favor. Councillor Fortini. Councillor Groves. Yes. Councillor Groves in favor. Councillor Innes. Yes. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac. In favor. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney. Yes. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden. Yes. Thank Counsel you. Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros. Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi. Yes. Councillor Pileshi in favor. Councillor Parrish. Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz. Oh, she be good. Yes. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato. She might just Sato. be too. She might not even yes. for another 15 minutes. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos. Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair. Yes. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr. Yes. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson. Yes, in favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente. Yes, in favor. And uh, Councillor Fortini is reporting that he lost his internet connection. He's trying to get back on, but he's a yes. They said they're over there. Call him. He'll answer. Okay. Th thank you. Carries. Thank you very much. That brings me to the remaining items that were held on consent. The first would be under items related to planning and growth management. Item 11.2, Region of Peel's comments on the second round of proposed regulations to the new community benefits charge. And it was Councillor Sato that asked that this be held. Councillor Sato on item 11.2. <laughs> See, I, I know exactly. Sorry, I think somebody else has their mic on. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Sorry. Um, I've lost the report on my agenda here, but... Um, we discussed this yesterday, and um, although we're coming at it from a different perspective in Mississauga, uh, ours, our report was basically, and our recommendations were based on how the capping was distributed between the high density, low density, and there was referral to that in the regional report. Um, as the impact is our social services, I would like to see the letter that goes to the minister, which includes, I know staff have already sent their comments to staff at the province, um, and that needs to be followed up now by the council um, approved uh, comments that, uh, that would be sent, I assume, with a covering letter from you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would like to see us in that letter as we did in this saga stress the impacts that we have been seeing with um, with COVID-19. Some of the decisions that the province of Ontario made a year ago in this regard to, to the Planning Act and the uh, community benefits and uh, uh, development charges, et cetera, were at a time when they were just basically cutting everything. And while they did backtrack a bit on the health and social service uh, funding issues, I think we need to continue to stress to them that um, initiatives such as this one are very badly timed given what we have been facing. And the fact that we will more than ever in the future going, going through this and going forward, we are going to need the additional funds that we would get at the region of Peel for the social and health services. So I, I really would ask that, um, uh, I guess we could do it as direction, that it be right up front in your letter to the minister that the time is just not right. And, you know, I think the premier would have to agree. Um, you know, he's been backtracking on a lot of uh, financial decisions that were previously made that um, quite frankly, you know, resulted in the province not being ready. On many on many fronts when uh, when the virus hit, so that was the only reason why I wanted to um, to hold that so that direction could be given by council. I, uh, we did it as part of our motion yesterday, and Mayor Crombie has already sent a letter 
word it to that degree with Mississauga's comments. Um, whether the clerk thinks it should be included in the motion or not, um, as long as there's very clear direction, I'm okay with that. Um, certainly agree with you entirely and happy to do so at the direction of council. I will turn it over to the clerk now who has a motion on the matter. So I'll need a mover and a seconder for the motion. I'll move it. It's Councillor Sato. Thank you. And second, second it's oh. Stephen Dasko. Thank you. I'll read the motion that the comment submitted to the province on its second round of proposed community benefits charge regulations as outlined in the report of the Commissioner of Finance and Chief Financial Officer titled Region of Peel's comments on the second round of proposed regulations to the new community <laughs> benefits charge be endorsed and further that the chair be directed to write a letter including a reference to the COVID-19 along with the endorsed comments. Councillor Sato, is that satisfactory, that wording satisfactory? Yes, I, I think that's all we need. The chair, I think the chair is very clear on, yes. on what needs to be in that letter. Yes. Thank you, then I'll call the vote. Mayor Brown? Yeah. Mayor Brown in favor, Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favor, Mayor Crombie? Yes. Mayor Crombie in favor, Councillor DeMurla is absent. Councillor Dasko? Yes. Councillor Dasko in favour. Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor Dillon in favour. Councillor Downey? In favour. Councillor Downey in favour. Councillor Fonseca? Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favour. Councillor Fortini? Councillor Fortini? Councillor Groves? Yes. Councillor Groves in favour. Councillor Innes? Yes. Councillor Innes in favour. Councillor Kovac? Yes, in favour. Councillor Kovac in favour. Councillor Mahoney? Yes. Councillor Mahoney in favour. Yes. Councillor McFadden? Yes. Councillor McFadden in favour. Councillor Medeiros? Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favour. Councillor Pileshi? Yes. Councillor Pileshi in favour. Councillor Parrish? Yes. Councillor Parrish in favour. Councillor Raz? Yes. Councillor Raz in favour. Councillor Sato? Yes. Councillor Sato in favour. Councillor Santos? Yes. Councillor Santos in favour. Councillor Sinclair? Councillor Sinclair? Councillor Starr? Yes. Councillor Starr in favour. Mayor Thompson? Yes, in favour. Mayor Thompson in favour. Councillor Vicente? Yes. Councillor Vicente in favour, carries. Thank you. Sinclair here, yes. Thank you, Councillor Sinclair. We've marked you as yes. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on then to the next item that was held at the request of Councillor Raz under items related to enterprise programs and services, item 13.5, 2019-20 dedicated provincial gas tax funds. Councillor Raz. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I answered my own question when I reread uh, a few of the <laughs> paragraphs. So I am good. I will ha be happy to move the report unless anybody else has any questions. Thank you. Seeing none, Madam Clerk, over to you. I have a seconder for that motion, please. I'll second it, Councillor Fonseca. Thank you, Councillor Fonseca. So motion moved by Councillor Raz, seconded by Councillor Fonseca, that the regional chair and the regional clerk be authorized to execute the letter of agreement provided by the Ontario Ministry of Transportation to obtain from the province of Ontario dedicated gas tax 2019-2020 funding for the region of Peel's public transportation program. Call the vote at this time. Mayor Brown? Yes. Mayor Brown in favour. Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favour. Mayor Crombie? Yes. Mayor Crombie in favour. Councillor DeMurla is absent. Councillor Dasko? Yes. Councillor right. Dasko in favour. Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor Dillon in favour. Councillor Downey? In favour. Councillor Downey in favour. Councillor Fonseca? Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favour. Councillor Fortini? Councillor Fortini? Councillor Groves? Yes. Councillor Groves in favour. Councillor Innes? 
Yes. Councillor Innes in favor. Councillor Kovac. Yes. Councillor Kovac in favor. Councillor Mahoney. Yes. Councillor Mahoney in favor. Councillor McFadden. Yes. Councillor McFadden in favor. Councillor Medeiros. Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favor. Councillor Pileshi. Yes. Councillor Pileshi in favor. Councillor Parrish. Yes. Councillor Parrish in favor. Councillor Raz. Yes. Councillor Raz in favor. Councillor Sato. Yes. Councillor Sato in favor. Councillor Santos. Yes. Councillor Santos in favor. Councillor Sinclair. Yes. Councillor Sinclair in favor. Councillor Starr. Yes. Councillor Starr in favor. Mayor Thompson. Yes, in favor. Mayor Thompson in favor. Councillor Vicente. Yes, in favor. Councillor Vicente in favor. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Clerk. That brings me down to item 16, communications, none before the chair. Item 17, related to health. We've dealt with all of them, Madam Clerk. Item 18, no communications item. Item 19 was held under consent, I believe. And yep. 20, also on communications. Brings me down to 21, other business or councillor inquiries. Seeing no, seeing, Mr. sorry. Mr. Chair. Yes. It's it's Carolyn Parrish. Go ahead. I just want to thank the staff and thank you. This was a very smooth meeting today. And thank uh, the staff of all th four levels of uh, or municipalities. I think this was a much smoother, very professional meeting. And thank you all. Uh, Carolyn, really appreciate your saying. Oh, so I've, oh. I've got I've got to thank the staff that uh, really took it to heart that it could have gone better last time and really redoubled their efforts from Sean on down. I really appreciate your saying so. Thank you very much. Okay, Madam Clerk, that brings me to the motions remain before me. Uh, this one I need a mover and a seconder with regards to the bylaws. If someone would move and second the bylaws for me. Raz can Alan. move. Alan. Raz and Thompson moved that the bylaws listed on the April 23, 2020 Regional Council agenda being bylaws 32-2020 to 35-2020 inclusive be given the required number of readings taken as read, signed by the regional chair and the regional clerk and the corporate seal via fix there too. Madam Clerk to conduct the vote. Are there any objections to that motion? Seeing none, that carries. Madam Clerk, next. Okay, yes, we're getting ready to move into Cameron. I think we have to, even though we're in an electronic world, there's some very strict provisions regarding that. So that deals with the formal agenda for the public. Madam Clerk, before we go in camera to deal with item 24.3. Thank you. We are moving into closed session. You do not have a video option during in camera. The screen will be locked with the closed session logo. As per the rules of electronic participation, each of you must declare that you will adhere to the confidentiality standards as outlined in the Regional Council Code of Conduct, which provides, when making decisions, the Regional Chair and members of Council will have access to information that may be confidential or contentious. The Regional Chair and members of Council will respect and maintain the confidentiality of information communicated to them in confidence by staff or colleagues. The regional chair and members of council will not disclose a document or information contained within a document provided for use in connection with a closed in-camera meeting of regional council, a committee of council, or of any body to which the member has been appointed by regional council. The regional chair and members of council will not disclose the deliberations of a closed session without the prior permission of the body holding the closed session. If you cannot make the stated declaration, or appropriate arrangements so that any other person cannot see or hear any of the confidential deliberations taking place, please withdraw from the meeting until we have moved back into open sessions. Members who leave the meeting during the in-camera session and attempt to connect back via the dial-in option will be required to send an email to council at peelregion.ca indicating their request to rejoin the meeting. We will temporarily pause the in-camera session and unlock the room to allow you to join. You will be required to identify yourself upon joining the meeting. So we'll need a move, uh, a mover and a seconder to go in camera. Plashy, star. You. Thank you. And we'll just give a couple of minutes to electronically move in camera.
Okay, we, we're out of camera at this point. So the, uh, I need a mover and a seconder for the motion about the appointment of the Associate Medical Officer of, of Health. Raz can move. Councillor Raz moves. Awesome. Oh, Thompson, okay, thank Ma you. Mayor Thompson seconded. So a motion moved by Councillor Raz and seconded by Mayor Thompson that Dr. Catherine Marsilio be appointed as Permanent Associate Medical Officer of Health effective immediately upon the effective date of the approval of the Minister of Health required under Clause 64C of the Health Protection and Promotion Act, and further, that documentation be provided to the Ministry of Health to apply for funding under the Provincial Medical Officer of Health Associate Medical Officer of Health Compensation Initiative, and I'll call the vote now. Mayor Brown? Yes. Mayor Brown in favour. Councillor Carlson? Yes. Councillor Carlson in favour. Mayor Crombie has left the meeting. Councillor Demerla is absent. Councillor Dasko? Yes. Councillor Dasko in favour. Councillor Dillon? Yes. Councillor yes. Dillon in favour. Councillor Downey? Councillor Downey? Councillor Fonseca? Yes. Councillor Fonseca in favour. Councillor Fortini? Councillor Fortini. Councillor Groves. Yes. Councillor Groves in favour. Councillor Innes. Yes. Councillor Innes in favour. Councillor Kovac. Yes. Councillor Kovac in favour. Councillor Mahoney. Yes. Councillor Mahoney in, fa in favour. Councillor McFadden. Yes. Councillor McFadden in favour. Councillor Medeiros. Yes. Councillor Medeiros in favour. Councillor Pileshi. Yes. Councillor Pileshi in favour. Councillor Parrish. Yes. Councillor Parrish in favour. Councillor Raz. Yes. Councillor Raz in favour. Councillor Sato. Yes. Councillor Sato in favour. Councillor Santos. Yes. Councillor Santos in favour. Councillor Sinclair. Yes. Councillor Sinclair in favour. Councillor Starr. Yes. Councillor Starr in favour. Mayor Thompson. Yes, in favour. Mayor Thompson in favour. Councillor Vicente. <clears throat> yes. Councillor Vicente in favour. It carries. Thank you. That brings me down to bylaw to confirm the proceeding of council. I will take that as being moved by Councillor Kovac and Jennifer Innes. I will read the bylaw itself. Bylaw 36 2020 to confirm the proceedings of regional council at its meeting held April 23, 2020, and to authorize the execution of documents in accordance with the region appeal bylaws relating thereto to be given the required numbers of reading. Taken as read. Signed by the regional chair and the regional clerk, and the corporate is sealed fixed too. Are there any objectors to the bylaw? Councillor Dasko. Councillor Dasko, did you have something? No, I don't have an objection. Oh, you're on our list. Sorry for that. So with that, uh, last call for any objectors. Seeing none, that, seeing none, that carries. And now I have a motion to adjourn from Councillors Mahoney and McFadden. Seeing no objectors, thank you all very much on a job well done today, especially to staff and the frontline workers. And, and we keep fighting and we're going to win this battle. Have a great afternoon, all.